in dialogue with the candidate for the position of the President of the General Assembly for its 75th session. I welcome you all to this meeting. The General Assembly in paragraph 73 of its resolution 71 slash 323 of 8 September 2017 decided in full respect of the established principle of geographical rotation and its resolution 33 slash 138 of 19 December 1978 to, to conduct informal interactive dialogues with the candidates for the position of the President of the General Assembly, thus contributing to the transparency and inclusivity of the process and call upon candidates to present to the Assembly their vision statements. Due to the continuing limitations on holding large in-person meetings as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, I decided to convene the interactive dialogue through the Cisco WebEx virtual meeting platform that we are already familiar with. Before proceeding further, I would like to request all participants to kindly turn off their microphones when they are not speaking in order to ensure an orderly discussion. I thank you for your cooperation. To ensure that participants' microphones and cameras are working properly, the Secretary conducted a pre-meeting earlier this morning. However, if at any time you encounter any technical difficulties in this regard, please contact the Secretariat staff designated troubleshooting on the information note. The contact detail of the technical focal point is also provided in the chat box. General Assembly will now hold a virtual informal interactive dialogue with, the Excellency, with His Excellency Volkan Bozkir of Turkey, candidate for the position of the President of the General Assembly for its 75th session. The candidate's vision statement was circulated in my letter dated 1 April 2020 and is contained in document A. Slash 74, slash 777. As reflected in my letter dated 8 May 2020, and consistent with the practice established during the previous sessions of the General Assembly regarding the modalities, the dialogue with the candidate will last up to two hours. It will begin with an introduction by the candidate of his vision and priorities for the presidency for up to 10 minutes, followed by an interactive exchange. Delegations wishing to take the floor can do so through the chat box of the meeting. Please inscribe by typing the name of your delegation and the title of your speaker. Please indicate that you are requesting the floor to speak. Delegations wishing to speak on behalf of a group of member states are also kindly requested to indicate so in the chat box. Those who experience difficulties in putting through their request for the floor in the chat box should contact the designated secretary of focal point for requesting the floor listed in the information note for this meeting for this meeting that was created among delegations in advance the contact detail of the focal point for the list of speakers is also provided in the chat box member states are encouraged to make concise and interactive interventions not extending, extending three minutes one speaking in the national capacity and five minutes one speaking on behalf of a group of states. I urge all speakers to kindly adhere to this time limit in the interest of ensuring the participation of as many delegations as possible. The candidate will give will be given the opportunity to respond to the questions and comments at regular intervals. Time permitting. The candidate will also have the opportunity to respond to up to three questions from other stakeholders, which I will randomly, which I will randomly, randomly draw from among the questions received through my website prior to the dialogue. In line with the overall objective of increasing the transparency and inclusivity of the process, the informal interactive dialogue is being webcast. I now give the floor to His Excellency Volkan Boskir of Turkey 
to introduce his vision and priorities for the presidency. Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, it's an honor for me to have this opportunity uh, to present my vision for the presidency of the 75th session of the General Assembly. Conduced, conducting informal interactive dialogues with the candidates for this position, of course, greatly contributes to the transparency and inclusivity of the process. I was uh, very much looking forward to this occasion, and I'm extremely pleased that Despite the existing challenges, we are able to have this dialogue today. In this regard, I, will, I would like to thank you, Mr. President, uh, as well as the Secretariat, Member States, and other stakeholders who made this uh, dialogue uh, possible. Uh, dear colleagues, Excellencies, my vision statement, uh, as the President has uh, uh, referred, was circulated to the membership on the 1st of April. It's also published as an official UN document and uh, translated into uh, all UN official languages. After my first uh, visit in January, uh, my intention was to come back to New York before the elections in order to meet with the representatives of all regional groups, as well as with the chairs, coordinators, and members of the groups of states. But unfortunately, uh, due to the uh, circumstances, Related to the pandemic, I was not able to make further travels to New York. However, in the last two weeks, uh, I had uh, the pleasure of having video conferences with almost 40 permanent representatives, including the monthly chairs of all regional groups, as well as the chairs and coordinators of other groups uh, of states. These were extremely useful exchanges, both to share my vision for the presidency and also listen to the various groups of countries about their special challenges and expectations uh, from the PGA. And today, of course, I'm uh, happy and honored to have this exchange in a plenary setting. Dear colleagues, uh, my detailed biography is available at the PGA website. However, allow me uh, to briefly share with you some points. I worked uh, in the Foreign Service for 39 years including 15 years as ambassador. I served as a foreign policy advisor of Prime Minister Turgut Özal and chief of cabinet and chief foreign policy advisor to two presidents, namely President Özal and President Demirel. Since 2011, I have been a member of the parliament. Throughout this period, I served as Minister for European Union Affairs and chief negotiator from 2014 to 2016. And rest of the time, I was the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Parliament. I was elected a total of four times uh, to the Parliament. The government of the Republic of Turkey had announced its candidature for the position of the president of the 75th session of the General Assembly back in 2014. And they officially nominated me to this position last September. With the support of the distinguished member states, I will be the first president of the UN General Assembly from Turkey. Uh, Excellencies, I have the privilege of addressing you as the unanimously endorsed candidate of VIO. Yet, uh, during my term in office, I will represent the UN membership as a whole. Every group's expectations and views will be equally important and valuable to me. The UN General Assembly is the most important multilateral forum for dialogue. It gives voice to the aspirations and needs of the peoples of the world, and the presidency of the General Assembly offers the possibility to facilitate uh, this uh, global dialogue. Over the years, the nature of the role of the PGA has evolved and expanded to attain a more political character. I'm ready to discharge this responsibility uh, with utmost care. In line with the scope and confines of the PGA's mandate, I will be the guardian of the rules of procedure of the General Assembly. And I will do my best to ensure the smooth implementation of the General Assembly agenda, as well as efficient management of its sessions. It's important that the main organs of the United Nations the General Assembly, the Security Council, ECOSOC, 
and the Secretariat work in harmony. Given the nature of relations between the PGA and the Secretary General, I have drawn up my vision in a way to complement the agenda and priorities of the Secretary General. I will also work closely with the President of the ECOSOC as the agenda of these two decision-making bodies complement and sometimes overlap with each other. It's needless to say, I will also establish channels of communication with all chairs of the main committees. Honorable uh, representatives, I believe that we need today the most is trust and cohesion among member states, major groups, and other international organizations. As PGA, I will be working towards achieving and consolidating this goal. I will choose quality over quantity. I do not intend to start new initiatives or create new fields of the General Assembly work, unless there is, of course, a real need or call to do so. Consensus building will be one of the core efforts during my tenure. I will use, to the extent possible, the moral authority and the soft power of the PGA. I will allow continuity with the work of the previous PGAs and make improvements when necessary. The overall agenda of our organization requires close coordination among the UN decision-making bodies. I will try to address the gaps and duplications as they relate to the agenda of the General Assembly. Guiding principles of my presidency will be efficiency, effectiveness, accountability, and non-discrimination. I will work with an international team, which will be no longer than larger than necessary. I will determine with the composition of the team in line with the principles of professionalism, merit, and expertise, as well as regional and gender balance. My team will operate on the basis of openness, inclusivity, and transparency. Like my predecessors, I will appreciate the contributions of member states to the trust fund in support of my office to make this team effort a collective success. This year, we are commemorating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Under the team, the future we want, the United Nations we need, we are affirming our collective commitment to multilateralism. Multilateralism and a rules-based international system are essential to fulfill the core mandates of the UN Charter. We should take full advantage of this historic anniversary to under underline the irreplaceable nature of the rules-based international system, as well as the imperative to consolidate. This becomes all the more important when multilateralism is under stress due to the challenges uh, re related to COVID-19. During the, such global challenges, the most vulnerable persons and countries take the worst hit. Their protection can only be secured through effective multilateralism and a rules-based international system. In this regard, UN Charter plays a central role. We need to uphold our charter and restore people's faith international institutions, in particular, of course, uh, towards the United Nations. We should keep in mind that there are already 170 million people around the world who rely on international humanitarian assistance. In addition, conflicts have increased both in number and duration, having aggravated the overall humanitarian situation and placed extra responsibility on the shoulders of the United Nations and the members. With this understanding, I intend to place an emphasis on the need to advance the UN collective agenda for humanity. I will pay particular attention to those who are most vulnerable, and I will make sure that they have a voice at the General Assembly. During the SDG Decade of Action, we need to ensure that all countries in special situations remain a priority. These developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states 
need our continued attention. I'm happy that my term will coincide with the fifth UN LDC conference in Doha in March 2021. It is important to make sure that COVID-related delays of GA work do not affect the ambition and success of this very important conference. Also, the implementation of the Vienna Program of Action will remain key in diversifying the economies and improving the industrial capacities of LLDCs. With respect to the special case of SIDS in the development agenda, effective and timely implementation of the Samoa pathway should be an integral part of our collective efforts. The need of the African countries and their special circumstances, including 2063 agenda, should continue to receive due attention. Another cross-cutting priority is to improve the living standards and rights of women. Women's full and equal participation in all spheres of life and strengthening their status within the society is an absolute must in all our endeavors. In addition, women's equal participation and decision-making is an indispensable part of our key on human rights. This is also a key element of democracy, lasting peace, and sustainable development. Over the years, member states have demonstrated their political commitment for the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls by ratifying and endorsing various conventions, declarations, and statements. One major <coughs> example is the designation of a specific sustainable development goal for gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. These commitments show that although there might be differences among countries' approaches, there is an important potential for cooperation to enhance this agenda. In order to realize the potential, we need to prioritize this issue in the UN and the General Assembly plays an important role towards this end. During the 75th session, both the official and unofficial meetings on women's rights and empowerment will have priority in my agenda. I will do my utmost to ensure these meetings receive the attention they deserve. I also support the Secretary General's objective of achieving gender parity at all levels at the United Nations. I will implement this objective in the composition of my team as well. We are now facing an unprecedented global challenge. COVID-19 is not only a health emergency or humanitarian crisis, it's a threat, also with social, political, and economic consequences, as well as with human rights repercussions. I wholeheartedly believe that the overarching priority is to ensure the health and safety of people. And at now I extend my sincere condolences to the countries who have suffered the loss of their citizens. And I wish speedy recovery for those affected uh, by the coronavirus. The international community needs a holistic approach in order to deal with the implications of the pandemic. In an interconnected world, none of us is safe unless all of us are safe. We hold humanity in this fight together, and it is time for uh, unity. The outbreak has coincided with the 75th anniversary of the UN. This is a stark reminder of the importance of effective multilateralism, and particularly the crucial role of the UN and its agencies. The virus does not see any borders or discriminate against faith, ethnicity, or citizenship. Thus, our fight against pandemic should not result in stigmatization, inequality, or injustice. The human fundamental principles of human rights and all other related commitments must be upheld at all times. A world free of COVID-19 will require the most extensive public health and social re recovery effort all over the world. Build back better should be our motto. 
I commend the prompt measures that President Bande, the Secretary General, and the President of the ECOSOC have taken. The General Assembly has adopted several resolutions with regard to the pandemic. These resolutions are important in terms of stressing greater sense of international solidarity and cooperation. Indeed, I, I truly believe that the General Assembly, with its universal membership and equal status of all its members, as well as its democratic credentials, is the most appropriate platform to provide uh, political guidance in responding to the pandemic. Dear colleagues, I would like to briefly touch upon the current working methods of the General Assembly, as this matter was often raised during my recent video conferences. We are going through no ordinary times, <clears throat> and in order to enable the decision-making capacity of the General Assembly, exceptional measures were put in place. Against this background, the silent procedure was introduced with the best intentions. However, we have all seen that it has always some collateral effects. I hope that we will soon return to normal functioning of the organization and be able to hold physical meetings without risking our health. If conditions do not permit us to do so, we should find ways and means, including technical infrastructure, to enable the General Assembly and other decision-making bodies to resume their functions in full. The pandemic, on the other hand, has already affected our future agenda. Many meetings are either canceled or postponed. Therefore, we may need to re review our list of priorities and further streamline the activities for the 75th session. This may necessitate compromises and in some instance, sacrifices, but this is a task, the first and foremost for the UN members. And I will remain ready to contribute to these efforts Within, uh, within my mandate. In the mandate, meantime, we have already taken some steps to modify our agenda in order to reflect current realities on our future work, such as the proposed uh, HLPF team of 2021, namely human well-being and the SDGs recovering after the COVID-19 crisis. The initiative and the decision that we have taken today will also need follow-ups in the uh, 75th session. In this regard, the Global Humanitarian Re Response Plan, as well as the Response and Recovery Fund, will remain part of our work in the next session, as these initiatives require mid- and long-term endeavors. Likewise, we will have to look at the 2030 Agenda with an additional dimension. The response to the pandemic will be cross-cutting element in the implementation of sustainable development goals, because effective response means development and resilience. Indeed, the 2030 Agenda is the right framework to underpin our pandemic-related efforts in the uh, UN uh, system. I also hope that we still keep a stronger touch with the reality and what matters to our citizens the most. In this regard, I would like to say that the priorities that I have pointed out in my vision statement remain valid, both for today and the 75th session, because they underline the needs of the most vulnerable in a wider humanitarian agenda. Once we turn the page on this epidemic, it's essential to fully understand and act on the lessons learned. This will enable us to effectively address similar challenges as they may arise in the future. In all endeavors, the UN, in particular the General Assembly, has the central role to play. Humankind has never lost a fight against a virus. We will outlive this menace and we will come out of it stronger. What we need is solidarity, partnership, and cooperation in, in their true meanings. Uh, dear colleagues, although the pandemic has heavily occupied our daily work, we should not lose sight of other equally important measures, such as the reform of the United Nations, revitalization of the General Assembly, financial difficulties of the organization, sustaining peace and prevention, mediation, 
counterterrorism and human rights, as well as the political issues in our agenda. For the brevity of my presentation, I leave the discussion on those issues for the rest of our dialogue. Within this vision and objectives in mind, I would highly appreciate the most valuable support of the member state for my candidature. I will now be very happy to receive your comments and answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. President and dear colleagues. I thank His Excellency Borkan Bakir for his statement. Before we begin our dialogue, I would like to reiterate that all participants should turn off their microphones when they are not speaking. I would like to remind participants that there is no pre-established list of speakers for this meeting. To record the flow, kindly use the chat box by clicking on the chat button in the menu bar on your screen. Inscribe by typing the name of your delegation and the title of your speaker. Please indicate that you are requesting the floor to speak. Dear colleagues, due to the large number of participants, your request may not be addressed immediately, but the Secretariat will be monitoring the chat box and will ensure that all requests for, this, for the floor are received and queued. Speakers will be given the floor in, in the order of inscription, and I will announce three upcoming speakers at a time to allow delegations to be ready to take the floor. After being given the floor, turn on your microphone and begin to speak. Please remember to turn off your microphone when you finish your statement. Should you be unable to speak due to technical difficulties, you will be given the floor again after a few speakers. If technical problems persist, kindly contact the troubleshooting focal point listed in the participant guide. Also, if you are experiencing internet connectivity and bandwidth issues, turning off your video may resolve the problem. If your internet connection is interrupted, please go to the meeting in, go to meeting, the meeting invitation and rejoin in the Cisco WebEx application. I now open the floor for comments or questions by member states. I now give the floor to Kebad on behalf of the African group. Kebad will be followed immediately by Cote d'Ivoire on behalf of the group of Francophone ambassadors to be followed by Cambodia on behalf of the Asia Pacific group. Thank you. Kebad on behalf of the African group, you have the floor, followed by Cote d'Ivoire and Cambodia. Kebar, Thank you, Mr. President. It's a pleasure to see all of you and special greetings to Her, His Excellency Mr. Volkan Boskir. The group of African states would like to thank you, Mr. President of the General Assembly, for convening this interactive dialogue with the candidate for the position of the President of the 75th session of the General Assembly. The group takes note of the vision statement presented by His Excellency Mr. Volkan Boskir and wishes to thank him for the principles highlighted in his pledge. The African group also takes note of the main issues that the candidate will prioritize, namely the celebration and team of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations in guiding the general debate of the 75th session, strengthening the multilateralism, as well as the advancement of the collective agenda of humanity, the achievement of the sustainable development goals, and the improvement of living standard and heights of women. This said, the group wished to address some questions to the candidate. Excellency, first, uh, you mentioned the pandemic COVID-19 as a main challenge of today, the need for focus and a global response uh, to this pandemic, including from the UN. Uh, during your mandate, do you foresee any specific initiative that, con that can contribute to the reduction of inequalities between countries and within countries that is now being exacerbated by this pandemic? My second question 
is about uh, the economic contraction induced by COVID-19. In the same vein, what role can the General Assembly play in supporting this search for sustainable solutions for the global debt that, it seems, will increase exponentially in the wake of this pandemic? Third, you mentioned in your vision statement that SDGs are the most transformative set of objectives yet cannot be achieved without strengthened global partnership and you stress the need to ensure that countries in special situation remain a priority as they lagging in the most of, of the SDG implementation. If elected, what your endeavor. In order to country. I, I know the camp, uh, you're working in depth insight in this issue. Finally, we noticed that the reform of the United Nations Security Council was not mentioned in your vision statement. Do you intend to focus on this issue? among your priorities during your tenure. I stop here to let others to take the floor. I thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Kebert from the Abut African Group, Cote d'Ivoire, on behalf of the Francophonie Ambassadors. Kebert, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would like to thank you for convening this informal Directed dialogue with the leaders for the position of president of the 75th General Assembly of the United Nations. Allow me to underline that I have been mandated to deliver this statement in my capacity as president of the group of Francophone ambassadors. Uh, first, the members of the Francophonie priority is to consolidate and strengthen multilateralism of the United Nations. The 75th PGA has a specific responsibility and central role to play as head of the only universal and multi sector organ that needs to deal with, with all global challenges from sustainable development to climate change, biodiversity on a high level present on the water, from respect for the rule of law to access to health, women's rights, and uh, the implementation of the Beijing Declaration. So we would like to, uh, to ask the following question. How do you envisage the 75th commemoration and more broadly the 75th session in view of these challenges? Second, members of the Francophonie reaffirm the importance of multilingualism for the legitimacy of the United Nations for all people of the world. All member states should also be able to express themselves and have access to information in the six official languages of the United Nations. We regret that meetings by video conference, which have become the modus operandi of the various at the exceptional time, are still not provided with interpretation services almost two months after the new working methods were introduced. We value the effort of the current PGA and its leadership and count on the Secretariat to enable the active participation of some delegations in the work of the United Nations as a matter of priority. Given the possibility of a second wave of COVID-19 in the OTAC, how do you intend to ensure that multilingualism continues to be respected in the longer run? Third and finally, COVID-19 crisis demonstrates the necessity to sharpen our focus on the main priorities, in particular by aligning the work of the GA and its committees with the objective of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. The revitalization process, hence, deserves our full collective support. To do so, we should strive to increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of this body, thus 
streamlining its agenda. I thank you for your attention. I thank uh, Cote d'Ivoire on behalf of the, the group of Francophone ambassadors. Cambodia, you have the floor, followed by Netherlands on behalf of the countries in the co group for, for LGBTI, followed by Italy on behalf of United for Consensus Group. Thereafter, uh, Ambassador Boskir will respond to the issues. So, Cambodia, please. Can you hear me, Mr. President? Thank you, Mr. President. I have the honor to speak on behalf of the Asia Pacific Group. Thank you, Mr. President, for convening this important interactive dialogue with Ambassador Volkan Boskir of Turkey, candidate for the position of President of the 75th session of the General Assembly. Thank you, Ambassador Boskir, for joining us today during this very difficult time for many people across the world. The Asia Pacific Group is grateful for your engagement and outreach efforts. And we appreciate you for your vision for the 75th session of the UN General Assembly as expressed in your vision statement. We are deeply committed to multilateralism in the attainment of the ambitious goals of the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and other action. We believe that the President of the UN General Assembly plays an important role in helping foster active international cooperation with a view to solving the most difficult problems of the day. For this reason, we note with satisfaction how you express commitment that you will represent the membership as a whole, take the views and interests of all member states into account, and will abide by the code of ethics of the General Assembly as stated in your vision statement. We are certain that you will undertake inclusive consultation with all groups regarding the work of the Assembly during your tenure. We strongly support your vision of consensus building as one of your core of efforts during the tenure of your presidency, as indicated in your vision statement. Consensus is the source of power of the General Assembly, and we hope this will be strengthened in the coming session. As COVID-19 outbreak has shown, it is ever more important to strengthen global multilateral engagement by working together in an open and coordinated fashion. It is by adopting such constructive approaches that the global community will be able to address the most pressing concern we currently face. The Asia Pacific Group appreciate that you prioritize the strengthening of multilateralism and rule-based international system. Our question is, what is your assessment of the biggest challenges to multilateralism and global cooperation during this extraordinary time. Also, it would be helpful to understand whether the COVID-19 pandemic has changed your views about the implementation of sustainable development goals and climate action. Do you plan to engage the whole, the whole of the UN membership in addressing this pressing issue? In the letter included in with your vision statement, you say, I quote, circumstances may oblige me to make certain adjustments in my priority during my term as the president 
of the 75th session of the General Assembly, unquote. At this stage, have any of your priority changed? If so, what are they? Please explain. Mr. President, I wish to conclude by expressing the readiness of the Asia Pacific Group to work closely with the President of the General Assembly at its 75th session. And wish you, Ambassador Bospier, great success in exercise of your duties during the session of the General Assembly. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank Cambodia speaking on behalf of Asia Pacific Group. And I now give the floor to Netherlands speaking on behalf of a group of countries in the co group for the LGBT, LGBT, LGBI. Uh, I would like to also just plead brevity uh, because we have so far almost 35 people wishing to speak. So please, I urge colleagues to, uh, to, 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 to be brief as much as possible. Thank you. Netherlands, please. Followed by Italy, after which Ambassador Boskin will, will speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can you hear me? Good. We can hear Thanks you. Thanks so much, Mr. President. And in honor of the new PGA, let me try to say that in Turkish. Teşekkür ederim başkanım. In my national capacity, as I'm speaking, Mr. President, let me also refer and align myself with the statement to be made by Olof Skog later on from the European Union. Mr. President, I am one of the two co-chairs of the core group for LGBTI rights here at the UN. And the other is our colleague from Argentina, Martin Moritan, and he is currently recovering from a severe bout of COVID-19 disease. And I speak on behalf of all of us, I think, to wish him a speedy recovery, and we hope to see him back amongst us as soon as possible. <clears throat> Mr. President, the key message of the core group is quite simple. Human rights equal LGBTI rights and LGBTI rights equal human rights. And diversion and inclusion are crucial for people of all sexual orientations and gender identities, wherever they are in the world. And my question to the new PGA is as follows. Do you agree with the fact that human rights equal LGBTI rights and that LGBTI rights equal human rights? Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, uh, Italy, on behalf of United for Consensus Group, thereafter, Ambassador Bastille will make his comments there. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I hope you can see me and hear me. Okay. Thank you very much for convening this meeting. Uh, we certainly value the opportunity to interact with the candidate PGA, uh, which contributes to the dimension of transparency and democracy of our organization. Uh, let me first uh, um, say that uh, I align myself with the statement uh, to be made by the European Union, and I will have some national remarks uh, before talking on behalf of the UFC group. Uh, COVID uh, presents us with tremendous challenges and a completely different landscape in which to operate. Uh, but is, it has not changed our priorities, and uh, we were happy to, uh, to listen from the new PGA that uh, this priority remains very strong. If anything, uh, COVID has made our objective and our work even more pressing. It had also confirmed the need to strengthen our collective action and, and make it more decisive. In this context, the role of the General Assembly will be even more crucial to promote significant advancement in the main mandates of the United Nations, and particularly on economic and social development and for the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda, and in the domain of human rights, where special attention must be devoted to women and girls. It will be necessary to pursue this objective through the lens of the current health crisis, which poses extraordinary challenges, but also provide us with opportunity to rebuild our present and shape our future in a better and more sustainable way. We welcome that you referred uh, to this approach in your presentation, and we trust that you would steer the works of the General Assembly towards supporting the SG appeals to build back better, as the world emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, 
let me just uh, maybe uh, touch on, on two issues, uh, the importance of focusing on the need, especially in these challenging times, to ensure that everyone, especially the most vulnerable, can have access to adequate, safe, affordable and nutritious food. Uh, this is really uh, a, a big priority and as chair of the group of friends of food and security and nutrition, we will welcome uh, the dialogue with you. On climate change, the objective to accelerate the transition towards low carbon and resilient economies has been made even more urgent. And in partnership with the United Kingdom, Italy will continue to work for a successful COP26 by mobilizing all actors. Um, let me now come to, uh, to uh, uh, the UFC uh, message to you, Mr. President, and also uh, a question. Uh, COVID-19 has had a profound impact on the working methods of the UN and its organs. Your emphasis on ensuring business continuity is noted and appreciated. In these times, we should announce our commitment to make the United Nations more effective and respond to the call to strengthen multilateralism. As coordinator of the UFC group, uh, we believe that a significant step to towards that goal would be reforming the Security Council to make it truly representative, accountable, democratic, transparent and effective. We are confident that you will pursue an inclusive path towards a solution that can garner the widest possible political acceptance by member states. And in that you can certainly count on our support. And we would like to hear from you, uh, your point of view on this very uh, crucial issue. Thank you very much. Excellency, uh... Uh, the floor is yours, if you can respond uh, briefly to the questions raised. You can see him. Uh, Excellency, are you with us? So can we just? I think we should. Can you hear me now? Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I will uh, first answer the uh, question of the African Group uh, uh, May Chair, uh, uh, the permanent representative uh, Jose Luis Rota. Uh, I think uh, COVID nineteen has unravelled our often disregarded systemic uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, poverty and inequality are global problems that uh, put immense strains on the effort uh, to achieving sustainable development. It requires a system-wide response involving governments, international organizations, international financial organizations, and the NGOs. The General Assembly is best placed to address these problems, and it is imperative to give due consideration on how we could further advance our work at the General Assembly. I'm ready to support the current initiatives uh, and related General Assembly resolutions, including the initiative of Alliance to Eradicate Poverty by President Bande. The number of countries at high risk uh, of economic stress has increased uh, with COVID-19, I welcome Secretary General's policy brief document on debt sustainability. I also commend the initiative of the Pakistan's Prime Minister on the same subject. The current uh, pandemic should consolidate our commitment for an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa, driven by uh, its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the uh, global arena, as foreseen in Agenda 2063. African countries are among uh, the least advantaged and furthest away from achieving the goals of the Istanbul Program of Action and the 2030 Agenda. So a large number of LDCs are from Africa. They are disproportionately affected by poverty and hunger, climate change, environmental challenges and unemployment. 
So the African continent requires increased support, ambition and solidarity. If we, if we let Africa fail in attaining SDGs, this will have a global implication. Avoid this, we should step up the efforts towards a prosperous Africa. We need to ensure that every country, including the African countries, benefit from globalization and prosperity. Commitments uh, articulated in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, including the Official Development Assistance, must be met. In conclusion, uh, the needs of the uh, African countries with regard to the SDGs and COVID-19 also requires the support and constructive engagement of the international organizations. In addition, uh, of course, to the United Nations. The uh, Bretton Woods institutions and global governance bodies such as G7 and G20 have roles in this regard. We need to create uh, synergies between the UN and all these organizations. If my involvement is requested, I will use the convening power of the General Assembly to, to this end. Coming the uh, question of uh, the permanent representative Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, let me also uh, say that uh, I will attach uh, great importance to safeguarding multilateral. And uh, as the PGA, I think this is uh, one of the most important tasks I will, uh, I will achieve. The General Assembly is the best reflection of multilateral action at a global scale. And we all have to stake in not only preserving, but strengthening it. So multilingualism is, is an important aspect of this endeavor. The UN languages are richness and rules of procedure is clear on how the UN conducts business in all six official languages. I understand that recently, due to the circumstances related to the epidemic, virtual meetings are only being held in English. Of course, this is a less than ideal situation that I hope we can overcome soon by undertaking the necessary technical work. All member states have an equal voice in the General Assembly. So it has unmatched legitimacy and convening power. Uh, revitalization of the General Assembly is at the heart of our joint efforts to make the General Assembly more effective and fit for purpose. The optimal use of limited resources, technical capacity and time is a more efficient and effective way of doing business. Uh, we need to enhance the and coherence by addressing gaps and overlaps and duplication where they exist. This is, uh, of course, a uh, great interest to the whole membership. I'm aware that it is a delicate task. I will certainly pay due attention to all outstanding issues and look for opportunities to, to bridge differences. We will continue to build upon the work that has been put together by the current co-facilitators, uh, permanent representatives of Ghana and Slovakia. In addition to the formal process, I am also planning to conduct deliberations uh, of, in informal settings, such as uh, morning dialogues and discussions uh, with former PGAs. And I think compromise is essential to make further progress in uh, revitalization efforts. All in all, I will try to address all matters related to General Assembly in a comprehensive uh, manner. And for me, revitalization of the General Assembly by the coordination among main organs of the UN, streamlining our agendas are part of, uh, part and parcel of a bigger endeavor. The third question was uh, from uh, Cambodia, the, uh, as the representative of uh, uh, Asian and uh, Pacific countries. Um, sorry, I just feel uh, the notes I've taken. Uh, 
agenda of the 75th session is uh, already full. So, uh, uh, therefore, I do not intend to make any personal initiative that would put uh, extra workload on delegations. I will only do so if there is a strong call from the member states of the, uh, to the PGA to take concrete action. So, my vision statement focuses, among others, on the agenda for humanity and countries in special situations. Uh, likewise, in our collective response to the pandemic, we focus on the special needs of the vulnerable groups and countries across the three pillars of the UN. From this uh, perspective, I believe that my uh, priorities remain relevant, both in terms of the current agenda, as well as the major UN initiatives, such as the uh, Global Humanitarian Response Plan and Response and Recovery Fund and the implementation in the wider framework uh, of uh, 2020 uh, agenda, uh, 2030 agenda. I'm indeed pleased that uh, the APG has given me an opportunity to further expand on my views regarding the SDGs and climate issues, also uh, from a COVID uh, perspective. Uh, last year, uh, during the high-level week, we had the SDG and Climate Action Summits. And this year, 2020 marked the beginning of the decade of action to deliver the SDGs by 2030. The, SDG, the 2030 agenda is the only universal framework to ensure that no one is left behind. It requires bold and transformative actions, aligning the agenda of the General Assembly in full support of the implementation of the 2030 agenda is necessary. Commitments in the 2030 Agenda, as well as the challenges in their implementation, are interrelated. It is, uh, therefore, imperative to take a holistic view of the 2030 Agenda. No country can resolve these issues alone, so multilateral action is necessary. With this understanding, I will keep the focus on the implementation, including the development reform, which aims at better delivery of SDGs. I will also follow closely the developments regarding the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing for Development and Pyrus uh, Climate Agreement. Uh, on the other hand, uh, COVID-19 has revealed the importance of an integrated and transformative response uh, to development challenges, including in the health sector. We may unfortunately experience, experience some setbacks in our hard-earned uh, SDG achievements due to the pandemic. And full recovery from the current crisis requires a strong commitment to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Eradication of poverty should remain our utmost priority. I welcome the recent initiative of President Bande establish an alliance of eradicate uh, alliance to eradicate poverty to follow up on related GA resolutions. Although the United Nations Sustainable Development Groups meeting on Wednesdays was a timely one to coordinate the UN system support to member states and to review progress in reinforcing humanitarian development cooperation. I also welcome the meeting of the United Nations System Chief Executives Board for coordination yesterday. Unfortunately, COVID-19 caused the uh, postponement of COP26 and uh, the Oceans uh, Conference as well. Yet, uh, General Assembly uh, should not lose momentum in addressing the climate challenge. I welcome the Secretary General's approach to recover better from the crisis, and we should use the opportunity to recover uh, better by increasing ambition on mitigation, adaptation, and finance. The Climate Action Summit uh, last September demonstrated that we are on the right track. Combating climate change must remain part of the efforts to achieve SDGs. UNFCCC uh, provides the platform 
to assist states in accessing technical and financial resources to accelerate uh, climate action. These type of initiatives and platforms can help create better and solid uh, national strategies and action plans. If I may come to the um, uh, question asked by the permanent representative of, of uh, Netherlands. Uh, the LGBTQI uh, is an important issue, and uh, my team and I uh, will work on the basis of non discrimination and will be inclusive in all endeavors in line uh, with the UN principles. Uh, that is uh, my statement vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, question asked by the esteemed uh, permanent representative of Netherlands. Uh, concerning the uh, question asked by, the uh, by Italy, uh, the charter confirms on the Security Council the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. As such, the ability of the Council to effectively uh, discharge this responsibility is linked to the credibility of the UN as a whole. Therefore, the question of Security Council reform concerns all membership. I know that there are diverging views and sensitivities around this topic. This is a membership-driven process, and I firmly believe in the power of dialogue and in the ability of member states to make meaningful progress. We can build on the progress made so far if we act in a spirit of goodwill and compromise with the political will as well as flexibility and uh, constructiveness. Continued interaction between all member states to seek further areas of convergence remains crucial. As it was recently announced, the scheduled meetings of the IGN process were postponed until further notice during the 74th session. Still, uh, member states and groups should remain engaged on this very important matter. During my term in office, I will handle this issue with utmost care and transparency, including in my appointments of IGN co-facilitations. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. I, I hope I have been able to give some replies. Well, thank you very much. I think I would like to indicate, uh, colleague, uh, Excellency, that brevity is important. A lot of people are interested in in making uh, important uh, statements. And I think, let us be brief to allow for this to happen. We have made a commitment to allow as many people as possible and we, we stand by it. This is an important process. So please, if you allow me, I will read out the next five speakers. And thereafter, uh, the candidate will respond briefly also. Uh, the EU, followed by the Guyana speaking on behalf of G77 and China, Switzerland, Slovakia, Lebanon. These are the, these are the five that will speak uh, uh, one after the other, please. The EU, followed by Guyana speaking on behalf of G77 and China, Switzerland, Slovakia, and Lebanon. Please be brief. There is a lot of interest in taking the floor. And let us please allow our colleagues to also uh, have their say, to interact with, the, with, our, with our candidate, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. President, and, uh, and uh, very good to see you all. I'll try to be very, very brief um, uh, in line with your appeal. Um, I, and just uh, first to thank you for getting us together and thank you to the candidate for uh, being very uh, uh, able and open to meet with us. We believe that these kind of sessions are extremely important. So thank you for that. 
I want to say that the uh, EU, and I speak on behalf of the EU and, and its member states, we've been very encouraged by the candidate's vision statement. Uh, we can subscribe to the priorities laid out, um, starting with reformation of the collective commitment to multilateralism and the rules-based international system, respect for international law, including human rights law and international humanitarian law, support to the UN reform agenda, including revitalization of the General Assembly, and to implement the SDG decade of, of action. Mr. Candidate, you have pledged strong support for advancing human rights, um, and in particular, the rights of women and children, including promoting gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, and that's well noted and appreciated. We would also like to highlight in this regard that um, gender-related human rights also include the advancement and protection of LGBTQIA rights, as has been mentioned. So we believe that all these priorities deserve our strong collective support um, because of its 75th anniversary, but even more so because of the global response to the current pandemic. Um, it shouldn't change our priorities, but it requires us to adjust many of them in ways that can be best uh, contribute to building back better agenda. And this should also include making advances on our ambitious agenda for climate action, biodiversity, water, making sure that we make the super year of nature 2020 a year of delivery. Um, President of the General Assembly has specific responsibilities um, um, as head of the only universal <laughs> UN organ. And we would also appreciate your uh, vision on how to organize the 75th session, and in particular how to hold a high level week amidst this continued uncertainty including the organization of a special session to commemorate the 75th anniversary. Um, the cornerstone of the commemorations is the declaration um, um, to be adopted together with the commemoration, and this includes having strong and active participation of civil society, private sector, and other stakeholders. Um, and we count on your commitment to make real progress in that in, uh, regard as to inclusion. We pay uh, tribute to actions taken by the current PJ and the Secretariat to allow this body to continue to perform its essential functions. But there are also concerns that need to be urgent, urgently addressed, such as the ability to take action on proposals foreseen in the Charter and the Rules of Procedure and ensure credible election processes in the absence of physical meetings. Multilingualism has been mentioned before and we subscribe to that is an unfortunate collateral damage of the current crisis. Uh, almost two months after new working methods were introduced, virtual meetings are still not provided with interpretation into the six official languages. And this, of course, limits the active participation of some delegations, particularly those with fewer staff and resources. And we expect this issue to be handled with priority. Um, in light of the fragile financial situation and coupled with the heavy workload of delegations, we welcome your commitment towards quality over quantity. And we also commend the, your approach to the um, working with the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly to work in harmony together. Um, we are encouraged by your commitment to efficiency, effect, uh, effectiveness, accountability, and non-discrimination as guiding principles of your presidency, which were, are essential for ensuring a level playing field, and they should go hand in hand with principles of integrity, impartiality, and transparency including strict adherence to the UN Charter and the General Assembly Rules of Procedure, as well as respect for resolutions adopted by all UN organs. We expect that uh, uh, any candidate to fully abide by the Code of Ethics, which should not only be such an, seen as an obligation, but rather as a way to strengthen the capacity of the President to exercise his or her duties while enhancing moral authority, integrity and credibility. I have a few brief questions. One, um, what lessons from the pandemic would you draw for the priorities of the General Assembly? And I wonder if you could shed more light on your vision to revitalize and better align the work of the General Assembly and its committees with the work of other UN bodies, notably ECOSOC. What do you foresee to ensure better NGO and human rights defenders access and participation in the work of the General Assembly? How can the General Assembly better mainstream human rights, including rights of women and girls, of children and older persons, in light of the COVID-19 
uh, crisis? And how do you intend to continue promoting gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls during your mandate? I uh, wanted to echo uh, the concerns raised earlier on the special situation for LGBTQIA community and uh, plea for full inclusion um, uh, as they represent a very vulnerable group in our societies. On sustainable development, what does Recover Better mean for you and how do you think the General Assembly can contribute to this? How do you intend to make sure that the 2030 Agenda remains the overarching roadmap for the work of the Assembly? And what is your vision for the decade of action? How do you intend to promote the concept of green recovery uh, in the context of combating climate change? And how do you intend to pursue the push for greater emphasis on the Secretary General's Sustaining Peace Agenda, notably in matters of conflict prevention, mediation and peace building, in complementarity with the Security Council? And finally, how do you intend to maintain the respect for the rule of law and international justice at the top of the UN agenda? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, I have Guyana. Let me, before uh, my friend, I've seen him uh, looking healthy too. Uh, before uh, Guyana speaks, to say that please, I beg your indulgence that we, we, we go beyond two because it's impossible to address. Uh, uh, we go beyond one to say 1.30, but please, we want to take all delegations as much as possible, including the civil society questions. So, uh, Guyana, on behalf of G77 and China, followed by Switzerland, Slovakia, and Lebanon. Thank you, Mr. President. I will be brief. I just want to thank you for the excellent job you're doing to keep our ship afloat and to manage the Assembly's response to the crisis, particularly since when you took over in September last year, COVID-19 was nowhere on the agenda. I also welcome this opportunity to hear the vision of the candidate PGA. Together, it will fall to the presidents of the 74th and 75th sessions to pilot the Assembly through what may be the most challenging period in the history of the United Nations since its creation after the Second World War. Unlike you, Mr. President, if elected, the candidate for the PGA will be coming into office with eyes wide open. And I know from having had the opportunity to meet with him in my capacity as chair of the G77, I know that he's fully aware of the enormity of the task ahead. This means that it cannot be business as usual. My question is, what does the candidate see as the role of the assembly in addressing the main weakness in the global response to the crisis. And by this, I mean the lack of coordination of the many well-meaning initiatives that are being taken by many different actors. I note that in his vision statement, uh, the candidate PGA intends to use the soft power of his office. And I wonder whether there are also other tools that you might consider using to ensure that the assembly is fully engaged in coming up with the bold and transformative action that is needed not only to overcome this crisis, but also to lay the foundation for a more resilient framework for global governance in the post COVID-19 era. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman of the group of China, Switzerland, followed by Slovakia, please. Switzerland. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for hosting this event, and thank you very much to the soon-to-be uh, President-elect, uh, Volkan Bosk, here for uh, giving us this uh, opportunity for an exchange. Thank you also for your vision statement, for sharing that with us. Um, probably by now uh, uh, you are aware that you get more than you bear bargain for, and I hope you're not regretting uh, your choice. Uh, uh, but uh, I agree with you and everybody who said it, the role of the General Assembly at this particular juncture and the role of the PJ, therefore, uh, couldn't be uh, more important. I want to quickly make two points. The first is on strengthening the General Assembly, which uh, uh, you mentioned it already at this point, uh, is really about uh, ensuring business continuity. We hope very much that under the leadership of the current president, we will finally be able to adopt the necessary rules to, uh, to uh, assure uh, elections and, and uh, decision-making under the current circumstances, even before your mandate starts. 
But the challenges will continue. Uh, it's relatively clear that uh, for many months we will not return to business as usual. And therefore, I would encourage uh, you to start reflections and also offer um, our support in this about how the, uh, the General Assembly is going to function later this year. How do we imagine the high level week? How do we imagine the work of the main committees? This is upon us very soon. This needs uh, new approaches, practical approaches. Uh, less is probably uh, more. Uh, we will not have delegations here or not many delegations from capital. All these needs to be uh, looked at uh, very soon. And uh, as I mentioned, we are ready to, to think with you, to help you uh, prepare for this phase. A second point uh, is in relation to the, uh, also your second point in your vision. Uh, you mentioned there that you intend to advance the UN collective agenda for humanity with particular attention to vulnerable groups in need and the people under oppression. I couldn't agree more with you. We very much welcome uh, this approach. Here again, the current pandemic uh, is uh, already and will for a long time increase the vulnerabilities. Um, I want to refer um, to some specific statements in regard fr from the Secretary General, from the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. And I would very much like to invite you uh, uh, during your term to raise the moral voice of the President of the General Assembly uh, when it comes to speak up against any sort of uh, discrimination and uh, for protection of vulnerable groups. You mentioned some in your vision statements. I, I would like to uh, mention a few others without being conclusive, of course. Uh, other groups like the LGBTQI community, uh, people with disabilities, uh, these days even people with health conditions are being discriminated, members of religious groups, ethnic groups, the LGBTIQ uh, community. Um, again, the list is not conclusive. Which brings me to the very last point. There is a group here at the UN called the International Gender Champions. You will get familiar with this logo very soon. We will reach out to you and hope very much that you, we can convince you to become a member uh, of this group. Thank you very much. You have the full support of the Swiss delegation and I wish you already good luck with your mandate. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Slovakia, please. Slovakia. So, I will ask Slovakia. Uh, if not ready, we we go to Lebanon, and then if Slovakia comes back, let us let us know. Yes. Lebanon. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. PJ, for your for your leadership and for convening this. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you for thank you for uh, for convening this. I'll be very very fast, very quick. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, welcome uh, the uh, upcoming PGA and wish him the best of luck. We're looking forward to working with him. Uh, uh, quickly, I would like to recall saying by Shakespeare, he said, there is history in all men's lives. You are embarking now on such a moment in the PGA at a historic time when the world has an opportunity to build a, a post-pandemic better future, as you said. What should be your or the UN's priority, number one priority in, when you are PGA, to have a post-pandemic better future? And how important a UN, digital UN should be in that future, please? Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. Uh, is Lubekia back? Okay, if not, then we, can we go to Oman on behalf of the Arab group? And then we'll close this session and allow the 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 the, 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 the candidate to, to respond also briefly. I will urge his response should also be brief. The list is long. So please uh, we have Oman on behalf of the Arab group, and then the candidate will, will respond. When we when we come back, it will be China and Spain that will Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I promise to heed your appeal for brevity, and I'll be very brief. 
and I would like to take the floor today on behalf of the Arab group, which uh, I have the honor uh, to be the current chair. Uh, as you have rightly mentioned, there are so many uh, interesting points in the uh, statement delivered by the uh, upcoming president of the next session of the General Assembly. Uh, we are very honored uh, to see Mr. Vulcan uh, and quite supportive to Mr. Vulcan, but also Mr. Vulcan to remain brief. As you rightly know, one of the most important issues that has been on the agenda of the United Nations since 1940s is the question of Palestine. I would like to ask you about your position on the question of Palestine when it comes to the United Nations and also when it comes to the General Assembly. You know, this issue is uh, very passionately one of the most solid issues that the United Nations has been following for years. And I'll be very interested to hear your points, your views on this matter, particularly as our colleague from the EU, Olaf, has mentioned. Uh, yes, you might use soft power as uh, alluded to by yourself and our colleagues, uh, Michelle, but also we would like you to also stand with international law, with the resolutions of the United Nations, particularly Security Council resolutions and the General Assembly resolution. To be brief, I would be very interested to hear your views and I'm sure the Arab group will be very interested to listen attentively to you. But also as we come along, we will try to also approach you on this matter in more specific without having to take the time of this meeting. Mr. President, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Berke. Please, uh, I will again ask you to be brief uh, as well in your response. Thank you. Is the voice coming? Uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I can fully understand your wish to be brief. But uh, you have seen the questions. Uh, the questions are spelled in three minutes, which requires an answer in 30 minutes. <laughs> so uh, uh, it will be very difficult uh, to uh, really go uh, in details uh, to, uh, to all the questions uh, uh, and replying uh, permanent representative by permanent representative would take more time. But please allow me as I as the main bulk of the uh, issues have been raised. Please allow me to, uh, in a way, to reply uh, all the five questions uh, as if it is uh, pronounced by one delegation. Uh, the first uh, issue is the general debate and the high level week. It will be a common decision of the UN family. In this regard, I'm sure the uh, the current PGA and Secretary General will conduct extensive consultations with the membership and seek also uh, my views in this regard. But health conditions and the course of the pandemic will be decisive factors. So, in any case, uh, my opinion is the 75th session can start on the 15th of September 2020 as planned. And if conditions do not permit us to hold the high level week in September, then we can reschedule it to a later date. We can, uh, we, we will perhaps remember what happened on the year of the 9-11 terrorist attack. The, uh, the General Assembly, uh, one week after the horrible uh, attack on New York, uh, convened, and they decided to have the high level week uh, in, in November. So this time we can perhaps, uh, check the, uh, what the conditions allow us and uh, decide on the date uh, of the high level week. For I think logistical and planning uh, purposes, our decision when to hold high level week has to be taken in advance. An organization of the elections of the Security Council and ECOSOC members, as well as the elections uh, of the PGA Vice Presidents and Main Committee Bureau will be our priority for the calendar purposes. So after that, we should pay more attention to the timing of the high level week and, uh, and uh, as well. So 
the, the, the next issue I would like to touch upon is, uh, it was another question, uh, the harmonization of General Assembly and ECOSOC agendas from an SDG uh, perspective. Uh, the General Assembly has already adopted resolutions that underline the need to enhance synergies and coherence and reduce overlap, especially in the second and third committees, in the light of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The way forward needs to focus on the implementation based on the many concrete ideas which were presented in previous years. Uh, a specific framework and updated mapping exercise in light of COVID can be established in order to identify and address overlaps and gaps in the agendas and in their coverage of the uh, 2030 agenda. Uh, benchmarking this process could bring discipline to uh, concrete targets. Multi-year planning and clustering of items can also be useful. However, the most critical element would be the positive engagement of the member states. I see that uh, certain progress has been achieved on the alignment process to develop possible criteria to identify overlaps and duplications, as well as in the involvement of member states, UN system and, and external partners. I also see that there is a general agreement among the member states to limit the number of high level events as well as side events in the margins of the uh, general debate. I will contribute to the efforts to further advance this process and avoid uh, pandemic related uh, difficulties uh, from uh, causing uh, delays. Uh, if I may uh, dwell upon now the, um, the next issue uh, mentioned by the uh, EU uh, representative, it is the, um, uh, well, the question was the NGO civil society participation in the UN work. Uh, Non-governmental non -government, non organizations are in a unique position to make valuable contributions to the work of the United Nations. With their proximity to the people, expertise in various fields and on the ground experience, I think the NGOs have the ability to understand and convey the needs and concerns of the people as they relate to the work of the United Nations. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated yet again the difference uh, these organizations can make at the local, national and international levels. So when it comes to achieving the objectives of 2030 agenda, the engagement of the civil society is even more important. NGOs are key partners in raising public awareness and ensuring social participation in realizing the sustainable development goals. So the United Nations already has in place a clear framework that enables and envisages the meaningful participation of NGOs in its work. So as president of the General Assembly, I will try to ensure an increased contribution from the civil society within the confines of my powers and the organization's legal and regulatory framework. And I will uh, make continued use of the existing framework uh, to ensure increased participation by NGOs, keeping in mind at all times the crucial goal of making the United Nations more efficient and effective in overcoming the complex challenges faced by the global community and I will support the efforts of the NGOs in my, uh, within my mandate. The next question uh, was uh, uh, concerning the, uh, I'm looking at the questions, uh, the UN work during uh, COVID-19. Uh, Uh, COVID-19, of course, uh, just fall from the skies and it has uh, not been expected. And uh, of course, it, uh, we have to really uh, be uh, ready to live uh, with the new situation. 
uh, it has naturally affected the way the UN works. In order to unblock the decision-making process, a silent procedure on consensus text has been introduced as a temporary measure and without prejudice to existing rules and procedures. Uh, this new method has enabled the General Assembly to adopt several uh, important resolutions. However, I think uh, the current inability to hold even the mandated meetings is taking a toll on the most needed consultation processes and the resulting UN actions. In addition to this, the silent procedure in its current application runs the risk of eroding the long-standing rules and principles of the General Assembly, in particular for the election uh, process. So we have to find a way to overcome this uh, problem. In this regard, I think uh, the appointment of the permanent representatives of uh, Afghanistan and Croatia as coordinators is a good step. I followed very closely the potential impact of the current situation on the upcoming UN work. Uh, certain postponed meetings will have to be taken up during the next session. Therefore, our agenda will be busier than usual, and there is no doubt that safety and security of people is a top priority. But the measures taken at the UN in the face of the pandemics, such as social distancing, suspension of physical meetings, and working from home, are necessary. However, I think all possible venues including consultations with the host country authorities, should be explored in order to ensure that the General Assembly resumes its full functions at the earliest possible uh, time. Uh, another question was, uh, was uh, the uh, harmonization of, uh, of the ECOSOC uh, agendas. Uh, uh, well, I, I think I answered that. Uh, the other, uh, the other question was the uh, women's uh, uh, rights. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, very important uh, to deal with this uh, important issue uh, during uh, my my tenure, and uh, uh, the. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, reach my notes. Yeah. Here it is. Uh, gender equality is uh, a cross-cutting issue in all areas of the United Nations work, and uh, including the SDGs, as well as peacekeeping and peacebuilding. We should build on the progress already achieved in the UN. Therefore, uh, I will devote special attention uh, to uh, promote synergy among General Assembly, the Security Council, and the ECOSOC on the issues related with women's rights. I will also pay due attention to gender parity while forming my, my team. 2020 was intended to be a groundbreaking year for gender equality. Among others, we marked the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. However, with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, even the gains made in the past decades are at risk of being rolled back. A UN policy brief on the impact of the COVID-19 on women explains how the pandemic is disproportionately affecting women and girls all around the world. From health to economy, security to social protection, the impacts of COVID-19 have been amplified for women and girls due to the pre-existing inequalities. So we cannot continue business as usual. Those inequalities should be addressed at the national and international level. And women make up the majority of the hardest hit in the informal economy and are at the front for, forefront of the community response. So COVID-19 response plans and recovery packages must take into account the gender-related impact of this pandemic. The UN, with all its agencies, should provide guidance and support to member states in this very important endeavor. 
This is a matter which my office will closely follow and will contribute to. At this point, uh, I would like to commend the Secretary General for his appeal on gender-based violence and COVID-19. I'm encouraged by the uh, recent launch of the Rise for All initiative that brings together women leaders to mobilize support for the UN Recovery Trust Fund and the UN Roadmap for Social uh, Economic Recovery uh, laid out in the UN framework for the immediate uh, socio-economic response of the COVID-19. Trends of Gender Equality, which aims to advance women's leadership in the United Nations. As the principal institutional standard-setting institution, the United Nations bears a special responsibility to lead by example. Therefore, I welcome the fact that gender parity was attained among Secretary General's senior management team and also among resident coordinators for the first time in uh, 2019. Uh, so this, uh, this is a testimony of the Secretary General's commitment for gender parity within the UN uh, system. Uh, so, uh, in order to realize that member states should also play their parts and support the Secretary General as uh, the as President of the General Assembly, the gender parity, parity will be one of my leading uh, principles uh, in establishing my team as well as my other assignments. Uh, let me uh, dwell upon the next question. the COVID uh, and uh, persons uh, with disabilities. I think uh, COVID affects the uh, vulnerable people and groups the most, including persons uh, with disabilities. The international organizations, including WHO, uh, OHCHR, special representatives and reporters are putting sincere efforts uh, to the, uh, in order to underline and address the special needs of the persons with disabilities in the face of COVID-related challenges. I know that there is also a member state-driven process, which is currently ongoing, in order to make a joint statement as a response to the Secretary General's uh, policy brief. I welcome the efforts of the main sponsors of this endeavor, entitled Disability Inclusive Response to COVID-19 Towards a Better Future for All. I'm sure it will receive support uh, from the uh, membership. The next uh, question uh, was uh, concerning the uh, uh, aging uh, older people and COVID. So COVID-19 uh, uh, continues to have detrimental impacts on the lives of older persons. Uh, from a medical point of view, if infected, older persons are higher risk of mortality and severe disease. From a social perspective, increased ageism, age discrimination and stigmatization unfortunately aggravates the uh, uh, vulnerabilities of older persons. So against these risk factors, special needs of the older person should be addressed, maintaining their health and care services, protecting them at home and in residential care, managing their unimpeded success to essential service during confinement, protecting their human rights, and last but not least, uh, fostering intergenerational solidarity are crucial. I welcome Secretary General's recent policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on older persons, as well as the support to this uh, policy brief that was that was signed uh, by by uh, 140 countries. The next question uh, will be uh, uh, will be the uh, uh, the uh, I think it was asked by the uh, by the uh, yeah, concerning uh, Palestine.
uh, the Palestine issue and the, uh, the General Assembly, uh, I think, uh, is an important uh, issue. And uh, the issue uh, of Palestine is, has been on the agenda of both Security Council and the General Assembly. So General Assembly adopts every year numerous resolutions regarding the uh, different aspects of the Palestine issue. As PGA, I will be guided by the previous resolutions, as well as the will of uh, membership. In doing so, I will uh, I will act uh, I will act uh, impartial and in line with the rules of procedures. And like in similar cases, I will remain close contact with the month chairs of the Security Council uh, as it arises. Uh, President, I'm sorry I'm taking long, but the questions were uh, really very uh, to the point. Uh, I don't want to uh, miss any 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 question uh, that was asked. Another question was uh, concerning the uh, uh, the south. Sorry, the uh, the, uh, the vulnerable groups. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, the principle of leaving uh, no one behind also entails empowerment of and taking into account the needs of all vulnerables as enshrined in the 2030 agenda. Uh, I think the, uh, the paragraph 23 of the agenda refers to the empowerment of the most vulnerable and includes them among groups whose needs are reflected in the agenda, all children, youth, persons with disabilities, people living with HIV AIDS, older persons, indigenous peoples, refugees, and internationally, internal, internally displaced persons and migrants, as well as people living in areas affected by complex humanitarian emergencies and in areas affected by terrorism. So I think this will be covered uh, respectively. Concerning uh, the other question, which is uh, uh, which is uh, let me see. Uh, that is. Uh, Agenda for Humanity, and my vision statement was asked by one of the uh, participants. I believe that uh, the primary purpose of the UN system is uh, to protect the most vulnerable. And migrants, refugees, IDPs, host communities, women, children, people with disabilities, and elderly persons, as well as vulnerable countries, such as those in special situations, are in need of support from the international community. So as far as the UN is concerned, this is an inherent part of the SDG agenda, as well as the UN humanitarian action. There are approximately 170 million people around the world who rely on humanitarian assistance. So in addition, uh, conflicts have increased both in number and duration, having aggravated the overall humanitarian situation and placed uh, extra responsibilities on the shoulders of the United Nations. And COVID, with all its devastating consequences, has made the current challenges even more complex and difficult. So I have chosen as my pri priority areas, among others, the agenda for humanity and the countries in special situations. So these are both interrelated and relevant to our current uh, and future work of the committee. Uh, so the major initiatives to address the challenges of COVID are comprehensive and multi-sectoral. The global humanitarian response plan, as well as the response recovery fund, are best implemented in parallel, but complementary processes. So <clears throat> addressing the uh, urgent humanitarian needs on the ground, as well as longer-term remedies, such as resilience and recovery, go in hand in hand and to maintain a strong development humanitarian nexus uh, will be important. With this understanding, I will contribute to the efforts of the 
Secretariat and the uh, UN uh, membership. Uh, I don't know if I have uh, I have answered uh, all of them. Uh, I hope I did. Uh, so, uh, President, uh, I leave it here. If there is anything missing, I will come back. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Excellency. I think we'll very quickly go to uh, China, followed by Spain, followed by Japan, Hungary, the United Kingdom, and Ireland. So it will be China, Spain, Japan, Hungary, United Kingdom, and Ireland. And uh, please, again, we have a long list still. Uh, please uh, be mindful that uh, there are lots of other speakers who have closed the list. And uh, His Excellency, obviously, uh, have been on the hot seat. I, 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 I appreciate uh, his time not to do this, but uh, we just have to do this because uh, we do have an opportunity earlier to interact a bit more, please. Um, so China, Spain, Japan, Hungary, United Kingdom, and Ireland for this round. China, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for hosting this interactive dialogue. Uh, also, thank you, Ambassador Bozkir, uh, for engaging us. I'd like to uh, convey best regard from my PR, and he had a very good conversation with you uh, a lot long ago. Uh, congratulations on the endorsement you received in your regional group, and we're looking forward to see you get elected as soon as possible. We believe you will make new contribution to the work of the UN and the General Assembly. The world is facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Your campaign efforts at this critical moment shows your commitment to the role of the UN and multilateralism. Facing with multiple, multiple challenges, strengthening multilateralism is a common wish of international community. China supports your efforts to strengthen multilateralism and global cooperation and to safeguard the international system with the UN at its core. We believe upon the core of the UN and with the concerted efforts of all of us, we will get through the crisis and embrace new development. Implementation of the 2030 Agenda is entering the decade of action. We need to give priority to overcome the difficulties faced by the least developed countries and the African countries and actively pro promote development cooperation. By doing so, we can achieve lasting peace and common prosperity. We also need to contain the negative socioeconomic impact in the post-pandemic period, in case it costs our early gains of SDG. China supports you spend more efforts in this area. Consensus, consensus building is where the power of the GA comes from. China appreciates that you put this as one of your core efforts in your vision statement. We will be happy to work with you to safeguard the unity among member states, properly handle complex and sensitive issues, so as to ensure the GA delivering on its important mandates. After you know, I see you answer all these questions. I think you are very, very well prepared. So I have no questions. So I will just uh, would like to express support for your candidacy and wish you success. Thank you. Thank you, China. Spain, followed by Japan and Hungary. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Bande. Thank you so much again organizing this meeting and to Ambassador Bothkir for the effort of uh, answering this very, very long list of questions. Most of mine have been already uh, answered in detail. I want to align myself with the statement of the European Union, where there were also a lot of questions here. And in the last uh, weeks and months, we have been working very close with Turkey on the Alliance of Civilization, Women and COVID-19 and also counter-terrorist uh, policies. So <clears throat> on that basis agreement, I only have one single question on top of my table. What can the General Assembly do to support 
the Secretary General in his call uh, for a ceasefire and for all the measures to fight together in a common plan the COVID-19. Unfortunately, we don't have a resolution yet supporting him from the Security Council. And on the 50, 75th anniversary of the United Nations, I think it's going to be crucial uh, to show the capacity and the effectiveness of multilateralism that the General Assembly goes a step further and really supports the Secretary General. What are your plans in this respect? Thank you so much and all, all the luck. Thank you very much, uh, Japan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we strongly support uh, your idea, Mr. Bolski, of uh, that value, that value multilateralism and rule-based international order. And, and these uh, basic ideas are critically important as we are witnessing uh, tectonic change in the world's political, military, and economic scenery. So during this moment of big change that the COVID-19 pandemic struck, that could uh, have a huge socioeconomic and probably political impact. So we wish to work closely with you, with the UN system, and member states, to overcome this coronavirus challenge and prepare for the better post-coronavirus world. In this regard, I would like to reiterate the importance of universal health coverage, on which I, as a co-chair of Friend Group, wish to work closely with you. As you rightly mentioned, uh, Mr. Boskio, how we act with countries and people in vulnerable situations, such as the LDCs, CEs, or LLDC, in starting the decade of action for SDGs, is critically important. Here, the basic approach should be people-centered and the one that pro protects and promotes human dignity, that's human security. As we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, we wish to uh, uh, make it an occasion, together with you, to reaffirm the importance of multilateralism, which uh, has the United Nations at its center. For the United Nations to play its expected center role, its reform, especially the reform of the Security Council, should be seriously discussed so that it reflects the reality of the international society of today. So meaningful progress, as you have mentioned, is mostly expected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Japan. We go to Hungary, please. Hungary. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much for this very important meeting. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome our president candidate, uh, also as one of the women PRs. Um, Mr. President candidate, we have at the moment 50 women PRs, and we have another 20 DPRs on the rank of ambassadors and also two observers, ambassadors. I'm just telling you that because if elected, which I think will happen soon, uh, traditionally I set up the circle of women ambassadors in 2015. We always invite the new president of the General Assembly to discuss all the issues which are very important for both of us or all of us. So you are very welcome and I hope we will meet there. But I have got two very quick questions. One is that, what is the footprint? So the image of you, you would like to leave here behind after your tenure. Um, and the other one, you talked quite a lot about the importance of building trust. Now, building trust between member states and building trust between the UN and the world, what is your, you know, possible framework for that. Thank you very much and good luck. Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hungary. Then get to United Kingdom. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President of the General Assembly for convening this informal dialogue uh, with the candidate of uh, UN 70, uh, of UNGA 75 and for his continued leadership during these unprecedented circumstances. At a time of acute global challenge during a pandemic that permeates every aspect of the UN's work, there is a huge need for multilateral cooperation and coordination. It is increasingly clear that UNGA 75 will be a pivotal moment for the United Nations as the world continues to grapple with this pandemic that requires global solutions. There is a lot to celebrate at our 75th anniversary and a lot still to achieve. We must aim high to make further progress on climate, 
to implement the SDGs and realize the 2030 agenda. We must also make sure we don't slip backwards, that focusing on COVID doesn't allow us to roll back on protecting human rights and many other important issues. We would like to thank the co-facilitators of the UN 75 political declaration, the ambassadors of Qatar and Sweden, for their continued work to make the upcoming anniversary both poignant and effective. We cannot miss the opportunity of UNGA 75 to revitalize the UN, bolster multilateralism and build back better. I thank the PGA candidate for addressing our questions about his plans for UNGA 75 uh, previously and how the COVID crisis might also shape this agenda. And we look forward to working very closely with him and I extend my best wishes for his preparations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, 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 we will we'll have uh, Slovakia and then Ireland. Slovakia was, was waiting for a long time. Uh, it's coming back. Slovakia and Ireland, and then we close for, for the for the candidate to respond, please. Slovakia followed by Ireland. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, apologies for the technical issue. I just couldn't unmute it for, for some reason, but I was ready. Uh, sincere uh, appreciation to both you and uh, our candidate, uh, Mr. Boskier. And I have to start by mentioning that this uh, important interactive dialogue uh, is actually only the third one of its kind. And uh, it has proven uh, an essential, uh, to be an essential component of uh, our work, fulfilling uh, its goal of enhancing the inclusivity the uh, transparency of the process of selecting the president uh, of the General Assembly. It is an important outcome uh, of the GA revitalization uh, process in recent years. Uh, and as uh, one of the current uh, co-chairs of the revitalization process, I really have to mention that and also thank um, Mr. Boskier for already addressing uh, several elements of uh, the revitalization process. Uh, which I'm very happy to hear uh, uh, will be one of his uh, priorities. Uh, and indeed, um, the current situation has forced us uh, to adapt uh, our working methods uh, uh, and uh, our work uh, even more. These past two months um, uh, that we have uh, witnessed uh, really brought a lot of changes and adaptations uh, in the UN agenda. So I believe um, it will be key uh, during the next session uh, for us to continue our reflections deeply and thoroughly on the lessons learned uh, and uh, during the next session, uh, continue uh, working and invest even more energy and efforts into streamlining and uh, the rationalization of our work, uh, including the resilience component uh, or aspect and uh, of course uh, uh, approaching everything uh, innovatively and boldly uh, maybe this whole situation provides us uh, also with a bit of uh, an opportunity for further renewal uh, we like others have mentioned already welcome uh, uh, his pledge to choose quality over quantity and it does apply uh, to the revitalization process uh, very much uh, and um, uh, he has addressed that, but still um, uh, maybe uh, he could uh, uh, mention a few additional specific areas uh, uh, where he would see a need for further adaptation to rapidly uh, changing conditions. And my second and last point uh, would be on the youth. Uh, just two days ago, we had a wonderful uh, town hall uh, event uh, where we heard uh, numerous ideas by the representatives of the youth from different parts of the world about actions that they would expect the UN to take in the short term as well as uh, in the long term. Young people have a lot of uh, uh, innovative uh, ideas. Uh, sometimes uh, they just lack uh, their proper place um, at the table. It happens not only at the UN, but uh, also on the community, regional, level uh, and, uh, and other levels. So I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Boskier uh, how he would like to involve uh, uh, the youth uh, and how he would like to ensure that the voices of the youth are heard even, even better and even more at the UN, uh, because really they can contribute uh, also to the reform processes of our organization. And uh, uh, today's youth, 
will be running the UN just uh, in a few years uh, from now. I would leave it at that, Mr. President. Uh, thank you and uh, best wishes. Thank you very much. Uh, Ireland will close this particular segment uh, before we return. we return to the candidate. Ireland, please. Thank you very much, President and uh, Ambassador Volker. Great to see you again. Uh, saw you a free few weeks ago. Uh, what a difference a few weeks make um, uh, in our world, as, as you know. Um, I just wanted to say that I was really happy to hear in your introduction uh, this morning that although it may look like you have a new uh, job spec or an adjusted job spec, that you're recognising COVID as a context that we're in here and that you're anchoring your plans for your tenure in the vision that you have and anchored by values and principles. And that actually matters a lot. I hope we're not deflected too much from uh, the, the basic work at hand here. I think that's an important message you've given us this morning. I'm a member of the ACT, the Accountability, Coherence, Transparency Group. Um, really welcome you being with us and speaking to us directly today. If I can make a plea that it's not the last time we see you do this and that as you assume your role uh, as President of the General Assembly, that we will have an ongoing dialogue with you. Uh, that matters for us. It's not just transparency or accountability. It's a wider relationship uh, because you're leading us in the General Assembly. Uh, as an Irish woman, I'm obviously, uh, I come from an island sort of on the edge of Europe, some sometimes say on the edge of the world. Um, but we come to the UN subscribing to the view you put about the central and irreplaceable value of the General Assembly. And I just wanted to underline for you my own sense that this is the one forum where a country like mine, a small country, and where I as a woman speak for that country, where I do so with an equal voice. It's the only place in the world that a country can come to where we feel we have an equal voice, equal opportunity, and where we're in theory gender neutral. So I just wanted to emphasize to you that the centrality of your role uh, in managing the General Assembly is a very precious one for smaller countries in particular. Our voices aren't heard often at other tables, and so we're giving you, in a way, our trust to do that. I'm a bit surprised, I'll honestly say, that this is the first time that we've entrusted Turkey, a, a large, important player globally, with this big role. Uh, it shows that rotation works eventually um, and that you, uh, you recognise the importance of your responsibility. I have two questions, if I may, uh, today. The first uh, it comes to a subject you've touched on a little bit. Uh, um, I spent two years as the chair of the Commission on the Status of Women, and I recently hosted two distinct discussions on the access for girls to education. Um, this week, in one of those discussions, Mary Robinson, who chairs the elders, talked about COVID as an exacerbator of inequality. And I just wanted to ask you what you would foresee in terms of your own role in ensuring what I think is a fundamental task. You've spoken about gender equality and about rights-based uh, work that we have underway. But frankly, none of that is possible unless the hundreds of millions of girls who are already outside the education structure and now because of COVID may never get back into a school, how you would see your role as contributing to making sure that those young women we get back with a desk can one day be at the, the peace building table. And that's the basic objective. My second question, uh, I just picked up in your remarks that you recognize the role you're taking up as a role with soft power. And that's that's absolutely the case. But you were also careful to say that you had a responsibility to bridge gaps. One of the big gaps I think we have in this house is that the, the big parliament of women and men, the, the General Assembly that you'll preside over, has a relationship, but not a very uh, successful one, I would argue at the moment, with the Security Council. Um, I'm a, an, a represent a country who's an aspiring member, so it's a vested interest question to you about how you will better build that bridge between the General Assembly and the Security Council. I believe um, that the members of the Security Council are at that table, many of them, 10 of them elected, not because of any divine right to be there uh, in their own right. They're there as representatives of the General Assembly that you will lead. So I think your role is very directly linked and in specific terms, there are two areas, the long overdue reform, as I would argue, of the Security Council, in particular in relation to some regions, um, particularly Africa. But I would also say in relation to the peace building architecture of this house, 
there's a big role to be played in bridging the gap between the GA and the Security Council. So I leave you with those two specific questions and thank you for being here. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll go back to the candidate. Uh, again, uh, we, we have up to 30 people on the list and it's after one, you see the, 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 the stress we're under. Uh, we see what we can. Uh, and uh, so please, uh, Excellency, you have the floor. After which we have Senegal, Armenia, South Africa, Nigeria, Qatar, and Algeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, again, I will uh, uh, try to uh, answer the question because there are uh, similar questions uh, in, in the different uh, from different permanent reps. Uh, so I will try to uh, go uh, go through the uh, issues. Uh, so the first thing is uh, COVID nineteen and uh, the UN Secretary General. I think uh, UN Secretary General has uh, timely launched three major initiatives, starting with an appeal for a global ceasefire, and the. UN Global Humanitarian Response Plan uh, for the most vulnerable groups, such as migrants, refugees, displaced people, and the host communities, as well as the UN Response and Recovery Fund for the least developed and the low mid-income level countries are also the steps in the right direction. Uh, we appreciate uh, support the UN Secretary General in this regard, and I I think it's a matter of concern that the uh, pandemic will have devastating effects, uh, mainly for those uh, vulnerable groups and uh, countries. So therefore, timely and effective implementation of the UN Global Humanitarian Response Plan and the Response and Recovery Fund uh, is, is important. And I think the international community should also pay uh, special attention to the needs of the most vulnerable people, including but not limited to women and girls, elderly children, and people with, with disabilities. Uh, concerning the UN Security Council and uh, COVID-19, uh, again, the Secretary General and the uh, General Assembly have uh, responded uh, to the outbreak of the pandemic through launching major initiatives for adoption of resolutions. However, uh, the UN Security Council, on the other hand, has met for the first time, discussed the pandemic after the fourth month of the out outbreak. Uh, it is up to members of the Security Council, of course, to define, define their role in the global fight against this challenge. Yet, uh, an active role requires a stronger engagement. So, with this understanding, I follow the developments within the Council on the joint uh, French, Tunisian, and uh, German Estonian texts. As it is true for all main organs the, of the UN, I think we can all benefit from a Security Council which is fit for its purpose as stipulated uh, in the uh, UN uh, Charter. Uh, concerning uh, the uh, youth, First, I'll dwell upon the human rights. According to the uh, UN Charter, human rights are part of this organization's core identity and one of its uh, three pillars. However, it is also a cross-cutting issue. Uh, therefore, upholding the human rights principles are fundamental to every undertaking of the United Nations. Human rights are also uh, an inseparable part of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. As the most representative body of the United Nations, the General Assembly and its committees have a special role in the promotion and protection of human rights, including women's rights, children's rights, and the rights of indigenous peoples and peoples uh, with uh, disabilities. So during the 75th session, uh, within my mandate, I will continue to put a special focus on the visibility of the relevant General Assembly uh, activities and ensure uh, meaningful participation of uh, all uh, stakeholders. Uh, concerning uh, the 
mute. Uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the first, yeah, the youth. Uh, I think the UN system should be more responsive, inclusive, uh, participatory, and representative, uh, to, representative to the youth. And uh, coordination and cohesion among its entities on youth related issues need to be strengthened to translate the 2030 agenda into local, national, and global action. The Secretary General's uh, UN Youth Strategy aims to address the needs and rights of young people and to ensure their engagement in implementation review and uh, follow up. So uh, I will work towards uh, improving the implementation of uh, the strategy, especially in its five uh, priority areas, including engagement, participation, and advocacy, as well as transforming these priority areas into uh, concrete uh, results. Uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the uh, question of uh, the Hungarian uh, charming permanent representative she said uh, what are would you like to leave behind after you leave this office i think this question goes uh, to me and to uh, the president uh, bande because uh, we he started uh, to a different uh, world and fall into this uh, unfortunate uh, epidemic which uh, in a way made everything very, very difficult and uh, sometimes impossible to realize. So uh, when I was uh, uh, planning my uh, tenure, I was already uh, under big responsibility to handle uh, the 75th anniversary, take over the flag from uh, President Bande to really give the, the world the, the messages uh, that the UN is a very important platform uh, and it is the, uh, the open platform for all the countries when they have a problem, when they need something, when they need a voice, uh, this uh, body will be uh, in, their, uh, in their service. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as I mentioned in my previous statements, we have to be more selective uh, when dealing uh, with this beautiful 75th anniversary. Uh, however, uh, what I will try to do uh, to carry the flag uh, I will take from uh, President Bande is to achieve the most under the very difficult circumstances. So it will be the success, not only my, mine, but the success of the United Nations. And my understanding has always been two things. One is trust cannot be 99%. It must be 100%. That 1% will ruin everything. So the trust must be 100%, as you have mentioned, uh, uh, permanent. Second is, of course, the quality uh, will be seen better in difficult situations. When everything goes on very well, you can't understand the, uh, the talents and qualities, not only uh, concerning my personal personality, but here the United Nations with all its bodies and with all its projects uh, has a chance in a way to prove to the world that it is uh, able to deal with this uh, very important uh, situation and come out uh, of it with a big success. So I will be very pleased to leave behind a, UN, a successful United Nations with all its bodies, and perhaps my name will be included in that uh, whole uh, activities. I, I will be proud of, uh, with that. Uh, concerning the um, uh, Irish uh, the per permanent representative from Ireland, uh, I think the rights of girls and their advancement uh, will be central to my efforts, uh, both under the general context of uh, 2030 agenda and the protection of the most uh, vulnerable, 
and uh, in this respect, uh, harmony among the main organs of the UN, namely Security Council, ECOSOC, and General Assembly, is central to the effective and efficient uh, functioning of the organization. So I will keep the uh, uh, channels uh, of communication open with the presence of other main organs. If it is found useful, I can even take an initiative to make this uh, coordination uh, regular. So uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, the project I have mentioned to have uh, during the mornings unofficial breakfast type uh, meetings where I, we can convene with permanent reps or other uh, people who can, who can uh, share ideas and then bring those ideas to the uh, official platforms could be something. But uh, absolutely, the, the Secretary General, the, uh, the uh, Security Council and the, and the General Assembly are three pillars and they don't have the luxury uh, to overlap uh, activities and to be in uh, bad relations with each other. So here, every uh, every of the three player has an important job to do, and a great uh, cake uh, in front of them. So I think the important thing is to bring these three institutions together uh, to achieve uh, the very important success that I have mentioned uh, for the United Nations as a whole under these very difficult circumstances. Uh, the president, I think I answered the uh, third wave. Uh, I hope I haven't missed anything. You, you have done. You have, you have answered the question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Excellency. I think we now go to uh, quickly to Qatar, Senegal, Armenia, South Africa, Nigeria, Algeria, Pakistan. We do need to do this because uh, we have gone far beyond our, our initial uh, idea, but. Delegations do need to engage, and we, 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 we have made a commitment to this, so with your permission. So, Qatar, followed by Senegal and Armenia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, can everyone hear me? Thank you so much. I would like to, of course, uh, you know, to thank you, uh, Mr. President, for convening this meeting uh, in such extraordinary circumstances, and we of course, renew our support for your efforts in that in ensuring business continuity of the General Assembly and creating the necessary conditions conducive to holding meetings against, of course, the backdrop of development of COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to, to welcome through you, of course, the participation of His Excellency, Mr. Volkan Bosquer, candidate for the presidency of the 75th session of the General Assembly and, and thank him for his frankness today in responding to so many aspects of the work of the General Assembly during our uh, debate today. What makes, of course, the upcoming session uh, of the General Assembly a unique uh, session is the fact that it coincides of, with the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, in which I am so honored to be entrusted together with Ambassador Anna Karen Enstrom of Sweden with the honorable task of, of uh, co-facilitating and drafting the declaration of the UN 75th anniversary. We're very pleased, of course, to see that Mr. Boscar's priorities are in line with the world aspirations from the United Nations on the eve of, of, this, uh, of its 75th anniversary, especially the commitment to multilateralism, the promotion of the United Nations collective agenda for humanity, conflict prevention, the promotion and protection of human rights, in particular women and girls, and the centrality, of course, of supporting, continuing the support for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Notably, as we, of course, embark at the beginning of the decade of action this year to achieve these goals, and especially as the world community faces the one of the major challenges this year, which is with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for the General Assembly to be the mobilizer for our collective action to build back better. Um, I'll end here, Mr. President, and I want to assure um, Mr. Busker, that he has the full uh, support of the delegation of the state of Qatar. Thank you very much, uh, my sister. Uh, Senegal? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Minister Busker, my delegation welcomes your vision statement. Your priorities are set out, largely address the concerns of the member states. 
So I congratulate you on the insight and the clarity you've shown, and I wish you good luck. Having said that, I would like very briefly to address a series of questions, very briefly, that my delegation considers important. The first is the prime, the prime issue of concern to us all, which is COVID-19. It is badly impacting all countries and more acutely developing countries, which efforts to implement SDGs are now gravely hampered. Already initiatives have emerged proposed by member states or groups of member states offering bold approaches and all situations to the problems, risks and challenges related to COVID-19. In the view of my delegation, it is important to bring some order, streamlining and coherence to these many useful and solitary, but diverse and fragmented approaches. In this regard, the current PGA has already been well inspired in appointing two core coordinators on these initiatives. In my delegation's view, it is important to stay the course and to pool all present and future initiatives on COVID-19, ensuring that the US nations can deliver to the world, not a multitude of responses, but one strong, clear, harmonious, coherent, and holistic response. Hence my country's attachment to the adoption of document in the form of omnibus resolution or omnibus resolutions on this issue. Uh, Mr. Boski, I would like also to very, very briefly also mention uh, the dire situation prevailing in two geographical regions. Even if you know that in the Security Council, under Chapter 7 of the Charter, is primarily in charge and is addressing those issues in those two regions. In those two regions. The first one is the Sahel, which in recent years has become a breeding place where criminal attacks by lawless Islamist extremists have brought death and all kinds of ills to countries once known for the stability. The other one, it has been mentioned by the chair of the Arab group, it is the, the, the occupied Palestinian territories, where the rights of the Palestinian, Palestinians are persistently obliterated, not only by the violation of human rights and humanitarian rights, but also by a ongoing rampant policy of illegal annexations. I think the heightened attention of the GA on these two issues will be useful to help address these critical issues. Now to conclude, let me once again mention the somber time in which we are right now, and in which developing countries badly affected by COVID-19 are keen to see the timely delivery of the SDGs. In this regard, and I'm glad you mentioned it earlier, uh, may I ask you what steps you think you might take to foster the implementation of this agenda, particularly for countries uh, which are suffering from underdevelopment, especially the Addis Ababa plan of action on financing of, for development. Mr. Boski, you already have the full support of Senegal. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Amenia? Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you for convening this interactive dialogue with the candidate of the 70s. Active engagement played an important role forcing the values of transparency electoral process. COVID-19 pandemic is at the UN. New context in which we operate necessitates even more exchange coordination and engagement. We have taken note that the candidate has conducted meetings with selected groups and individual member states. And we also note that so far there has not been broader engagement with the group of the Eastern European and I would like to highlight the importance that Armenia attaches to the smooth and effective operation in carrying out its mandate throughout the upcoming session. The 75th anniversary of the United Nations is a key milestone to recommit ourselves to cooperation for dialogue, peace, and reconciliation, engaging effective and expected to be critical in this process. The landmark anniversary of the UN stands also as an important reminder about the human dignity and the need to foster a global environment in which all people can exercise their fundamental freedoms free of coercion and exclusion on any grounds. Being a landlocked country whose access to sea by the neighboring transit country is essentially blocked, Armenia is committed to multilateral cooperation for development and promote inclusive, human-centered approaches in line with this. We are convinced that strong adherence to all purposes and 
should guide the multilateral efforts for peace, security, and development. As a consistent supporter and promoter of the concept of practice of prevention, we remain resolute to continue to contribute to the agenda within the General Assembly. We continue to carefully review the professional record of the for 75th session positions of the nominating country. We have duly noted the existing procedures and the context in which the elections will be taking place and will formulate our approach in due course, taking into account also today's debate. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, South Africa, followed by Nigeria and Algeria. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We appreciate this timely interactive discussion with the incoming uh, PGA Ambassador Volkan Oskar. This vision statement resonates with some of the priorities of South Africa in the United Nations. Amongst this is the importance of strengthening the role of the General Assembly and the 20th and also as a context for building back better from the COVID-19 pandemic. We also uh, are aligned with his, with his thinking on the promotion of sustainable development and sustaining peace in the African continent, as well as gender equality and women's empowerment. As, uh, and of course, the commitment to multilateralism underpinned by the importance of the UN Charter. We wish to comment on two areas in particular today. First, one of the areas that is lacking in the overall work of the General Assembly by far is the reform of the UN Security Council. Since 2005, we have not made much progress in this area. We therefore hope that Ambassador Bosquet will give impetus uh, to this process uh, during his presidency. We look forward to the early appointment of the core facilitators of the IGN process. Second uh, comment that we wish to make is that in the context of the 75th anniversary of the UN, one of the areas that has got a strong cross regional appeal is the area of conflict prevention. We therefore look forward to hear from the incoming president his views and plans on how conflict prevention can be enhanced in the work of the General Assembly. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Nigeria, followed by Algeria and Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. President. We want to thank you for the very fantastic job you've, you have been undertaking in spite of the hiccups created by the COVID-19 pandemic. We also want to thank you for creating the opportunity to meet with the PGA aspirant. We are indeed impressed by what he has told us so far. I must also confess that uh, he's already looking very PGA-ish, and uh, we want to assure him of uh, Nigeria's support and cooperation. Uh, we also agree with him that the services session will really be burdened by the rollover of mandates, and as such, there should be no need to take up new initiatives unless it is extremely important. Um, we, some of the questions we wanted to ask have been asked, so uh, we just want to dwell on this, that uh, uh, the rollover of the mandates have been caused by the advent of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And right now, science has not been able to tell us when the pandemic will end. So I want to ask, you, Mr. PGA aspirant, what are your contingency plans if this pandemic does not go away as anticipated? I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, uh, Algeria. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sofian, we can hear you. 
Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, technicians, can you please advise uh, Sofian, uh, uh, the PR of Algeria, uh, wh what are the issues are? Sofian, can you hear me? Algeria. Technicians, can you assist? Let's get back to Algeria. Okay. Go back to Algeria. Uh, uh, if Algeria is not able at this time, let's get to Pakistan and Indonesia. Pakistan, and then we go back to Algeria. Uh, Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. President. I hope you can hear me. Thank you. We can hear you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. First of all, uh, Mr. President, thank you for organizing uh, these consultations. Uh, uh, this has been a very comprehensive uh, coverage of all the questions. And I will not add to the, the questions that have been posed to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Boski. Uh, we are fully confident that uh, he will be uh, a superb president like yourself, uh, Mr. Mr. President, and achieve um, uh, objectives that we are looking for in this, uh, in this uh, crisis. Uh, I would just like to underline that the role of the General Assembly during this uh, upcoming 75th session will be critical in all the three core areas of the United Nations responsibility with regard to development, uh, where we have to achieve the sustainable development agenda and get back on track. And here, uh, Pakistan, uh, which will assume the presidency of the ECOSOC later this year, uh, we look forward to working very closely uh, with our brother, His Excellency Mr. Boski, uh, to promote uh, the development agenda. Uh, as far as peace and security is concerned, again, because of the paralysis or virtual paralysis in the Security Council, the, uh, the responsibilities of the General Assembly will become even more critical. Uh, we are very uh, heartened by the fact that his Excellency Mr. Boskil has underlined the importance of addressing the plight of vulnerable people, uh, people especially migrants, refugees, people in conflict zones, uh, people who are under foreign occupation. Uh, my brother from Oman and Senegal uh, have referred to the Palestinian people. Uh, let me also mention the people of Afghanistan, who are suffering from terrorism uh, and conflict, uh, and also the people of Kashmir, uh, who are occupied and subjected to state terrorism. Finally, uh, to our new incoming president, uh, sir, I would like to underline that there is a revival because of the COVID crisis, but even before then, a revival of extremism across the world, extremism from right-wing groups, extremism from religious groups. And here we would hope that uh, the rise of xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and racism will be a priority for our incoming president, and that we will be able to address these in, in a concrete way in the coming assembly. I thank you very much, and I thank our, our incoming president for his patience in responding to all our questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, my brother, also for talking about patience. I think we, we thank uh, uh, Excellency for patience. Uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll take uh, Indonesia and then Algeria, but I'll beg your indulgence, uh, uh, um, the indulgence of the candidate. Uh, 
I will now read, just after Algeria, I will read three questions from the civil society so they can take them on board. We'll, we'll get back to all the, all the members listed here will speak. Let me just read the three questions so that you, you take note of them. Uh, so I'm taking three questions. One, two, at random, I, I have no idea what they are. So please, I'm quickly reading one. How can you help address current conflicts such as the Chinese-USA trade war? This is the first question from civil society. Next is, do you think we can achieve all the SDGs by 2030? Or do you think we need to extend the decade for delivery and action for another 10 more years? Question number three, how do you see the United Nations in the next 10 years? Do you think it will be able to have more authority over member states? Or will it be the other way around? These are the three questions. So please just take note of these questions and answer them alongside the ones Algeria, uh, we have Indonesia and Algeria. And then after that, you answer the questions uh, before you. Thank you very much. So we go back to Algeria, uh, no, Indonesia, please. Indonesia and then Algeria. Um, thank you, Excellency, uh, the PGA, for organizing this important meeting. Um, appreciate uh, His Excellency Mr. Rokan Buskir for sharing his vision and priorities for the presidency of the 75th session of the UNGA. Uh, thank you for addressing a lot of issues already today. Uh, most of the questions that I have has already been asked. However, I still have uh, several points to make. First, the 70th session will be a challenging time for uh, dramatic change in the global landscape. Uh, fighting COVID-19 pandemic needs a whole world approach. And we are feeling the economic ramification, even possibly a global recession. We must also address social impacts, especially for the poor, poorest and people in vulnerable situations. In this regard, I do have uh, two questions for you. Um, as I mentioned before, UN 75 is a great opportunity to strengthen collective commitment to multilateralism. In this regard, what will be your definition of the future we want and your mission in ensuring that the UN uh, fit for purpose on the upcoming decades? Uh, second question is, could we ensure the effectiveness and efficiency of the UN in the midst of depleting UN budget? Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. Back to Algeria then. Sophia? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I would like to thank you for organizing this uh, informal dialogue and thank Mr. Volkan Boskier for giving us the opportunity to hear from him on his pledge for the presidency of the 75th session of the General Assembly. It is an important moment to exchange views in these regards. While my delegation uh, aligns itself with the statement made by the chairman of the G77 and China, the African group and the Arab group, I would like to make a few uh, comments. Mr. Boskier, your presidency of the United Nations General Assembly comes at a very critical time, at a time where uh, we are about to celebrate its 75th anniversary. The United Nations is at crossroads due to the upsurge of unilateralism affecting the multilateral work that have characterized international relations over the past few de decades. Besides the current crisis of the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, which impact all aspects of lives, have already affected the way we conduct our business and rearrange our priorities. Now more than ever, the global threats confronting us are unprecedented and there is an increasing need to strengthen multilateral action and ensure the implementation of the principles and goals set by the Founding Fathers in the Charter. In this regard, we believe that we should work to strengthen the General Assembly, which reflects the real picture of the international community and one of its most democratic components with the principle of one state, one vote. A revitalized General Assembly can push the international community for more solidarity in the interest of all humanity. 
In this regard, we are glad to acknowledge that you have put the humanity agenda of the United Nations at the forefront of your concerns while giving priority to the people and their oppression. Here, we would like to know you how you intend to push this agenda forward. Otherwise, development is one of the three pillars on which the United Nations is based to ensuring prosperity and well-being for all. Here again, your presidency coincides with the launch of the Decade of Action to implement the 2030 Agenda, our roadmap toward a sustainable development that leaves no one behind. What is your perception of the work that the United Nations General Assembly can do to achieve everyone's right to development? As the country that makes women empowerment in all fields, at, at all levels, one of its most priorities, and has made important strides in it, Algeria is pleased that you make it your priority, as well as in support to the Secretary General objective, aiming to achieve gender parity at all level at the United Nations. On this point, my question uh, has already been taken care of by my previous colleague. I think that you have already respond, responded to this question. Finally, we cannot avoid raising the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic as it will inevitably shift the future of international action by conferring greater importance to health, TIC, research and development issues. In this regard, bridging the technology gap has become more urgent than ever due to its devastating impacts on, at all levels. The lack of access to technology has deprived many of having access to education and basic services. What is your perception of the United Nations agenda in light of these challenges posed by the spread of COVID-19 and its future working method? I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you success in carrying out your future endeavor. And you can count on the support of the Algerian delegation in this regard. Ramaziniz Mubarak Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Sofian. Uh, let me uh, beg your indulgence. Uh, we are unlikely to have to 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 to, to, to uh, have the service continue beyond two o'clock. We have up to seventeen delegations. So what I would like to do is to uh, beg the indulgence of uh, uh, the candidate to please take quick notes of the questions or issues raised by colleagues who will each have a minute to say what they need to say so that uh, you'll answer all together. Uh, I think I will just continue now to, to have delegations uh, speak. Uh, please, if you allow me. Uh, you, Uruguay, Morocco, Uruguay, Singapore, Malaysia, please. Excellency, I will do us. Yeah. Please, yeah, please. I think it, 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 uh, so Uruguay, we are looking for expecting you. Are, you. are you there? Okay, if Uruguay is having difficulties, we'll come back to it. Can we go to Morocco? Kingdom of Morocco, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Dear Ambassador Volkan Boskin, First of all, I would like to express the Morocco's full and strong support to your candidature. Two, Morocco shares your commitment to multilateralism with the United Nations at the East Core. We particularly welcome your attention to align complements and support the Secretary General priorities and agenda, namely the UN reforms agenda and the 2020 vision. Third, we also note with appreciation the strong focus of your pledge on development, in particular, the attention given to the special circumstances of LDCs in achieving and implementing the 2030 Agenda, as well as the gender parity and humanitarian issues. Four, we salute your vision to lead the work of General Assembly 
in an effective and efficient manner and are comforted by your intention to not create new burdens for the GA. I have, Sir Ambassador, just two small questions. As PGA, how would you mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the upcoming work of the General Assembly, particularly the high-level week? How do you envisage the, this year general debate in case the pandemic lingers? Two, while with so many mandated activities being postponed due to COVID-19, how would you prioritize, prioritize them? Oceans Conference, BBNG, NPT, to name just a few. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uruguay, Morocco, and if Uruguay is back, Uruguay will join. So, Uruguay and then Singapore, please. No problem. Hello? Uruguay? Mr. President, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for convening this dialogue and thank you to Volkan Boskir for his very informative uh, presentations. I, I, Mr. President, I will be very brief. In, uh, it seems like a long time, but just in December 2019, during the Paraguayan chairmanship of the group of landlocked developing countries, we gathered under the auspicious of the General Assembly for the midterm review of the Vienna Program of Action for LLD. We adopted an oriented outcome to accelerate its implementation. In this context, we really appreciate the priority that Ambassador Bosquira allocated to groups of countries in special situations uh, uh, in his vision. And we would like to know of further plans and action that we can expand expect from here during his tenure to support the LDCs, LLDCs, and states toward the achievement of the SDGs in which the priorities of each dedicated program of action of this group of countries play a very special and crucial uh, role. Furthermore, as many other developing countries, Paraguay relies heavily on the trade of commodities, in our case, uh, as net exporters of food and energy. We firmly believe that we should tackle the challenges presented by the current pandemic through a strong commitment with multilateralism. In that path, which will be the approach of the candidate to help countries overcome the initial hardship of the pandemic to uh, assist them to realize their potential and boost their recovery in an environment of solidarity and cooperation on a regional and multilateral scale. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for giving me the floor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and then Philippines. If Uruguay is ready, it will join after Philippines, please. Singapore. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Ambassador Volkan Boskir. Thank you for the opening statement as well as your vision statement. I just wanted to underline a few points. First, I think for all small states, the role of the UN and the General Assembly is very important. And it is really important that the PGA, including the incoming PGA, take note of the importance of reaching out and engaging with smaller countries for whom it is a question of existential importance uh, that the work of the UN uh, is being done. Um, I wanted to make one quick comment and a suggestion uh, to the PGA candidate and to all of us, in fact. I think the key challenge for the UN and for the General Assembly is relevance. In fact, there's a real danger that everything we say and everything we do here at New York may be deemed to be irrelevant or insufficient by our people and by our leaders. It is therefore really important that whatever we do, we should um, be seen to be helping resolve the challenges faced by governments and our own people. In this regard, it is not uh, realistic to continue with business as usual. We have to review our working methods here in the General Assembly. 
and we need to reach out, uh, especially to the small states and to the vulnerable states. And here comes my suggestion uh, to uh, both the PGA as well as the PGA candidate. I would suggest that in the context of COVID, since travel is no longer a reality, um, that instead of the incoming PGA making travels to other countries, that the incoming PGA consider engaging with ministers and decision makers in our capitals through video format in the form of roundtables as a way of listening directly to concerns uh, of our people and our leaders uh, back in our capitals. Uh, the other suggestion I would have is uh, for the incoming PGA to give some serious thought to en engaging the private sector because ultimately implementation of Agenda 2030 require strong partnership with the private sector. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Burhan. Uh, Malaysia? Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, for convening this interactive dialogue. And thank you, uh, H.E. Volkan Boski, for your vision statement. Let me reaffirm Malaysia's commitment and stance on the crucial role of the PGA as the guardian of multilateralism, which represents all 193 member states. I wish to refer to your earlier statement, saying that we have to live with the new situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking ahead, there were suggestions by some that the UN should begin uh, digitalizing its operations, including on voting process, elections, and in-person negotiations even after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. What are your views on this? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is, is Uruguay ready? Yes. Okay. Uruguay. Help me? Please, yes, go ahead. Okay. Do you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Go yeah. ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. My uh, thanks to you and uh, also to Mr. Bolton Bostir for his participation and mission statement and all the answers provided to us. To us. I didn't and speaking on the um, to the principles and documents that rule the General Assembly works the, during this timely certainly create that transform, transform and transparent environment among member states and the secretary, which consider vital for the solid result of our decision. And with this clear way, to describe the importance of your pledge, Mr. The United Nations during 35 years, Uruguay consider now is a perfect moment to take stock of what has been achieved, acknowledging the lesson learned and underscoring more than ever importance of multilateral agreement. This in mind, we comment the co-facilitators of the process to adopt a declaration for the 75th anniversary of the organization. And therefore, we look forward to reflect the great achievement of the multilateral actions so, so far, while at the same time, raise our voice with solid and proper arguments against the speech that, that undermines, undermines the organization and the multilateral system in court. I would like to speak, uh, Mr. Bosker, view regarding the course from the current situation created by COVID-19 pandemic, and which gives you uh, new avenues for more sustained economy and social development for the future. Uruguay con considers a 75th anniversary of the United Nations to be the occasion for the launch of an initiative for a more integra integrated Management of international institutions. I mean, coordination with the UN system itself, Australia with the um, World Health Organization of FAO, and between the UN and the <laughs> institution and the WTO. Finally, I fully support the expression of the Mr. Volkan Boskir on the idea to having the high level. Um, of the General Assembly and specific and that the, the 
commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the UN in a person in a meeting, actual meeting anyway, with the presence of the delegates and high level meetings. And in this case, I agree with that we can look forward. It's not possible to do that in September. We translate that to November, November this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have now uh, Philippines and Afghanistan. Philippines, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. President, Your Excellencies. Thank you for convening this interactive dialogue. I have the honor to convey the Philippines questions. Noting His Excellency's mention of countries in special situations as one of his priorities for the 75th session, the Philippines is keen to get the candidate's perspective with regard to addressing the specific challenges faced by middle-income countries or mix, especially as we enter the decade of action in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and considering the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We look forward to the meeting that the PGA is mandated to convene in the 75th session on the gaps and challenges of middle-income countries in the implementation of the SDGs. Indeed, the discussions in MICs are mixed at the UN have increasingly gained traction and prominence. How does the candidate intend to sustain and further advance these discussions? Second, Disarmament is a vital component of international peace and security, and we recognize that the current international security environment is fraught with uncertainty and tension, particularly among the various member states. The lack of trust and confidence for one can lead to logistical and administrative issues that delay the substantive work of the committees of the General Assembly. The Philippines question is, what are the available remedies that can address this issue? Finally, and third, how does the candidate view the linkage between UNGA and the United Nations in Geneva and human rights issues? How can this be improved or strengthened? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank President, you Your Excellency. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have now Afghanistan, followed by Latvia and Saudi Arabia. Afghanistan, followed by Latvia and Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President, for holding this very informative interactive dialogue today for the President of the 75th session of the General Assembly. I shall thank you, Your Excellency, for your very dedicated le leadership of the General Assembly during the very unpredictable and challenging times of COVID-19. I also have to express my gratitude to PGA candidate Mr. Volkan Basker, for the opportunity to be able to listen and hear your very inspiring vision in important priorities. And thank you for honoring the pillars of transparency and openness in this process. Thank you for your attention and focus, among many others, to the issue of women's empowerment. Please be assured that Afghanistan will be one of your allies and supporters as an interest with the UN member state in this very important issue as well as one of the vice chairs for the PGA, for your excellency to achieve your goal. Thank you for your comprehensive response in regards to COVID-19 related questions raised by earlier speakers, but I shall highlight your reference to countries in special situation that will be requiring additional attention. As my colleague said, the role of the President of the General Assembly is critical to an effective and efficient UN and its member states' engagement. Under the leadership of the PGA, we are brought together to conduct our work in the spirit of unity and partnership. In time of unprecedented and uncertainty, this role is more important than ever. Afghanistan appreciates Your Excellency's commitment to multilateralism which is needed more than ever in the history of the UN and the times we live currently. And as we all work once again to build a better world, the PG of the 75th session will be inheriting an uncertain world as set. 
and at this time, sustained dedication to the values which you laid out in your vision statement will be utmost important to achieve a better and more equitable future to all of us. Your Excellency, please rest assured of Afghanistan's commitment to work with you during your tenure as the PG in the upcoming 75th session. My mission is looking forward to be working with your team and please count on us. Thank you and look, thanks again. Thank you. So we have Latvia followed by Saudi Arabia and Andorra. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Yes, Mr. President, thank you so much for hosting this marathon session of consultations. I want to add a, a word of support to dear Volkan Boskir and looking forward to see you very soon in, in New York in, in person. Uh, uh, dear Volkan, in your presentation, you mentioned a few times words transparency, trust, resilience. And as we are fighting uh, globally currently the COVID epidemics, we are also are confronted with explosion of uh, infodemics, uh, disinformation which is uh, recognized by the Secretary General is one of the major distractions to our common fight to, 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 to deal with, with the COVID. Uh, could you share your views on, on, this, uh, on this phenomenon of incredible importance? Thank you and full support from Latvia to your future efforts and every success. Thank you. Thank you. Saudi Arabia followed by Andorra and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yeah. Yeah, that that you hear me? Excellent, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for holding this uh, meeting and to commend you for your leadership under difficult circumstances uh, that have been able to bring us together uh, on this occasion. And greetings to His Excellency Minister Boskir, and uh, we wish him well in his future assignment. Uh, and I encourage uh, Mr. Boskir, His Excellency Mr. Boskir, to continue the process of communications with the membership uh, and with the, with the PRs, either collectively or in groups, uh, through a meeting of this sort, preferably in person, uh, throughout his, his tenure. I think that communications of this nature is very essential to the success of the relationship with the PJA. Uh, I wanted to raise a couple of points. First of all, uh, the UN had set as its target during this period of time business continuity. And business continuity sounds to me like the lowest possible, the lowest common denominator uh, that ensures near survival. Now, that's understandable when the epidemic was starting and when we were finding our way through the process of holding these meetings and processes and so forth. But I think that under your leadership, uh, Excellency Mr. Boskir, we should aim higher and we should aim for not only business continuity, but also improvement of our processes and uh, the, the use of modern technology in, in how we conduct our business. Crises offer opportunities. And if we don't turn these, this crisis into an opportunity, we would have been missing, we would be missing a great deal. So I hope that you would give that uh, your attention and, and, and your support. Uh, also, I'd like to raise the issue of the long standing items on the agenda of the General Assembly, including the reform of the Security Council and the revitalization of the General Assembly. These have been, both of these subjects have been on the agenda for many, many years. And uh, presidents of the General Assembly have been, uh, I wouldn't say satisfied, but, but they have surrendered to the notion of having to deliver this to the next president and, and so forth. I hope that you would make an effort, Mr. Boskier, uh, in your mandate to try to close both of these subjects or at least one of them. One of them is the revitalization of the General Assembly, 
which is within the domain of the General Assembly, we should be able to conclude this topic and reach agreement and reach conclusions about it. The same applies to the reform of the Security Council, but I realize that that is uh, more difficult as it is relates as it relates to the uh, consensus of the P5. But at least uh, I would hope that you would make a commitment to endeavor to close one or both of these subjects during the, your period of leadership. Uh, the next point I wanted to, to, to raise uh, was to comment on the desire of some of our colleagues of various member states to try to pass on to the membership their set of values and on social issues that are not necessarily shared by the membership. And for one of them to, to claim that the entire body of human rights, as we know it, is only equal to the human rights of a subgroup of humanity. I think that that's uh, uh, a disservice to the, to the human rights. I commend your answer, which was accurate and, and very specific. And I hope that our colleagues uh, from all countries would refrain from trying to uh, introduce or impose their set of social values that are not shared by the rest of the world. Finally, I join my colleagues from Oman, Pakistan, and the Senegal on the issue of Palestine and say that uh, uh, we will probably face uh, the question of annexation in the next few weeks or in or during the 75 session. And I think that the General Assembly will be required to take a strong stand and the President of the General Assembly will be required to represent the will and the desire of the General Assembly in uh, blocking and condemning uh, such an act. I hope you would be able to live up to that responsibility and to act in your capacity as the moral authority that you have referred to. Uh, I wish you the best of luck, uh, Excellency Minister Boskir, and I thank you again, President uh, Tijani. Thank you. Uh, so we have Andorra, Islamic Republic of Iran, Fiji, and Jordan in that order. Andorra, you have the floor. Dr. Bosker, uh, for your presentation uh, and your references to trust, the attention to vulnerable people, uh, the agenda has really a very, a very long uh, list, and, and I'm going to repeat or maybe to insist in some of the uh, issues that has uh, already been uh, been raised. But I want to uh, to support your remarks by the permanent representative of Cote d'Ivoire uh, in favour of a multilingualism an interpretation in our meetings. And we really appreciate uh, uh, your reaction, um, Mr. Ambassador uh, Boskir, uh, for your, and your reply in this regard. And this crisis has shown how crucial the technology is becoming in our current work. So you count in your support on the ongoing efforts of the Secretariat. And really, we I think that uh, uh, United Nations could be more in in, in this regard, if it's possible. Uh, Agenda 2030 is uh, another issue I wanted to, to raise. And as you stated, the SDGs and the gender, the guidance and the multidisciplinary and holistic um, way to cope with COVID-19 and its consequences in, this, uh, in the next session. And in this uh, general framework, I would like also to insist that uh, my colleague, you know, uh, uh, Irish colleague uh, in education of quality, SDG 4. Uh, it has been repeatedly and increasingly mentioned in the assembly in the last year, and is really as a necessary cross cutting um, uh, uh, SDGs, uh, transforming the world for women, transforming the world for girls, need really this right um, to be fulfilled. But it, we are really behind uh, that. So, the many initiatives, many important um, projects are emerging, and it's really important also that uh, maybe the assembly could uh, bring all of them together and insist many in, more in this uh, in this question. 
And I don't want to, to conclude without uh, mentioning the SDG 15 climate change is really relevant, is urgent in the context of the COVID-19, as has, has been said and, uh, and already you were mentioned in your, in your remarks. My uh, question is very easy. Uh, from your position of PGA, uh, do you have plans um, the, for uh, the assembly in this concrete um, SDGs I, I mentioned? I thank you very much for uh, being there for your uh, reply, and I wish you well in this in your tenure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a run for by Fiji and then Jordan. Iran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you for organizing this very important uh, meeting. I want to thank uh, His Excellency Mr. Boskir for uh, being with us today uh, and uh, for his uh, vision statement. I want to assure him of our full support uh, during his presidency. Uh, I have two points to make. One is uh, with regard to the question of Palestine, as uh, the previous speakers have, uh, have already talked about this, this important issue. Uh, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, Palestine uh, is, is an important issue for the whole membership. And uh, at this juncture, we need to join forces to protect the uh, Palestinian people, uh, particularly in the uh, coming session of the General Assembly. The second point is with, with, with regard to the fact that despite the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the urgent need to join forces uh, to combat this disease, uh, resort to unilateralism continues. Uh, that inhibits uh, the efforts of targeted countries to fight the pandemic effectively. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Boskir uh, how the presidency of the GA will, de will deal with this uh, issue during the 75th uh, angle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Fiji followed by Jordan and Cyprus. Thank you, Ex Excellency, and uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Boskid. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, 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 our PGA and candidate PGA. You are uh, extraordinarily brave uh, uh, leaders, uh, uh, putting up with the whole of the GA at a time when both of you are fasting. And uh, so, uh, and I'm using this also to convey my uh, Ramzan Kareem greetings uh, to you. Uh, from Fiji, uh, many things uh, have been said. Uh, we will share our remarks, uh, but two or three uh, very quick uh, uh, comments. A number of uh, our colleagues have spoken about special circumstances, and I'd like to stress special circumstances of small states, uh, small island developing states. Uh, uh, every country is uh, exceptionally, extraordinarily st uh, stressed, so I do not want to say that we face uh, 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 problems that are extraordinarily different from other countries, but in some small uh, problems that uh, small island states face uh, do require uh, uh, global cooperation in a, in a different way. I'll give two examples to, uh, uh, so for Fiji and many Pacific Island countries, because we do not have market size, uh, if uh, we wanted to, uh, in response to COVID today, simply buy a ventilator, we get assured delivery dates of around August or so. So that's one. Oh, uh, because we cannot access uh, markets uh, as, uh, as a consequence of supply chain uh, problems, uh, and uh, we can no longer uh, buy medicine in India and some of the countries uh, that we used to buy, and we have to pay 10, 15, and in sometimes 30, uh, 30 times more the cost of uh, for uh, for normal uh, medicine. Uh, but that's assuming that we can then get them into our countries, which is a huge challenge. But uh, all of these require. Uh, in small small problems that we face, uh, a quite significant uh, global cooperation. So I just wanted to use these two examples to to say uh, some of the challenges that small states uh, face. Um, uh, Mr. Boske, uh, we also know that in uh, 2020 was going to be a super year for nature, as uh, we were saying, and it remains so because we are fully committed. Uh, we are going to have the second UN Oceans Conference, the Biodiversity. Uh, uh, conference, the uh, COP26, and all of these uh, uh, put together uh, would have uh, give, uh, give give lot more weight and momentum to our climate and oceans uh, uh, commitments. And uh, 
uh, I, I very much appreciate your thoughts on the, on how we maintain and accelerate and uh, and uh, give more momentum to to oceans. We are small states, but we say that we are large ocean states, uh, small Pacific states, uh, which you will be meeting, uh, I hope, uh, very soon. Uh, on the surface of the planet, they hold about hundred, uh, not hold, uh, they they share about in stewardship. Uh, about 100 million square miles of the surface of the planet. And uh, these are a threat, uh, these are threatened uh, by human action, uh, by climate change. Uh, and if we did not take uh, uh, much more dedicated action globally, multilaterally, uh, then uh, the, uh, we might be uh, threatening the future source of feed, uh, food for all humanity, but as well as a future source of medicine for uh, next pandemics and, uh, and for next uh, uh, or, or for uh, medicines that, uh, for diseases that have been escaping uh, sort of uh, medical uh, development. So I thank you very much. We look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and Jordan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, current PGA, Professor Bundy, for your leadership and for uh, hosting uh, and continuing to. Uh, to host this uh, marathon meeting. Ramadan Mubarak to all. Thank you also, candidate PGA Minister Volker for your vision statement and your priorities, which we welcome and we support, and we will cooperate with you fully to move forward and to realize them. Your commitment uh, to multilateralism, to collective action, to strengthen global partnerships, strengthen uh, GA, climate change, the SDGs and the empowerment of women and girls and their rights are all crucial and welcomed by Jordan. We also hope that uh, conflict resolution and building peace will be one of your most immediate priorities, especially as was mentioned by many of my colleagues, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and also other conflicts in our region and the world. I join colleagues who highlighted the issue of illegal annexation of land in the occupied West Bank and its dangerous repercussions to, be, to peace and stability in the region. And I hope that you will be able to give this issue your focused attention. Jordan also encourages you to focus on building a country's resilience and tackling issues of the refugees, because this is very important. And also we stress on the issue of youth and the importance of their active involvement at the United Nations and in their communities. We look forward to work and cooperate with you through our current uh, health crisis, the COVID-19, which confirms and focuses our objectives to rebuild better, to help vulnerable people and countries, especially in the area of health and also economically, building capacity and moving forward to realize the SDGs in an inclusive and sustainable manner. Uh, Mr. Volker, Your Excellency, you have answered uh, many of the questions I had. But uh, I have two uh, quick questions. As a country with 20% uh, of, of our uh, uh, inhabitants now or our people are refugees, how do you see uh, your role as PGA in helping refugee host countries, especially now in light of the acute economic pressures that, uh, that COVID has even uh, exasperated uh, in these countries? And the other issue is was mentioned by some of my colleagues, but I will highlight it again. The issue of fighting violent extremism and terrorism, its, its re-emergence, especially uh, at this point uh, when COVID uh, is going to bring more poverty and less hope and, uh, and more unemployment, etc. This might uh, put the youth under more pressure or under, uh, uh, you know, to be, to be lured by all these uh, kinds of uh, groups. So what is your vision to help curb this in light of increasing poverty and vulnerabilities? And also how to promote interreligious harmony and peace uh, to fight xenophobia, negative stereotyping, and to promote unity, hope, harmony, and peace. We believe that these are issues that are extremely important, and we will work with you hand in hand to make sure that we promote them and we work uh, to, to help you bring solutions to these, uh, to these issues and to these problems. Thank you very much. We wish you all the best and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, Cyprus followed by Uganda and Kenya. Cyprus, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Iyakshamar Ambassador Boskir, thank you for being with us today. We consider the screening of all candidates 
vying for elected positions at the United Nations essential for the level of transparency and openness we want to achieve. Cyprus is fully represented by the statement of the European Union. I would like to thank you for your stated commitment to the UN ACQUI and to the equal treatment of all member states. For reasons that are obvious to everyone, my delegation is eager to ensure that this will be the case in practice and that all decisions and resolutions of all UN organs will be respected scrupulously. I cannot overstate the importance attributed by my delegation to the transparent and impartial conduct of the OPGA, particularly when dealing with sensitive issues. The PGA, of course, once elected, is the incarnation of the international community and not a representative of his or her country of origin. In this context, I would urge you to reach out and hold bilateral meetings with states which are seeking certain assurances from you in order to also discuss these concerns in a more private setting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now Uganda followed by Kenya, Bolivia, and Interparliamentary Union, which will be the last one. So Uganda, Kenya, Bolivia, and finally Interparliamentary Union. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, uh, warmly welcome uh, the incoming PGA Ambassador Volkan Viska. Good, uh, good to see you. Uh, the position of PGA, my colleagues have emphasized, I couldn't emphasize more how important it is for the UN and multilateralism in general. And uh, for that matter, you have the support of uh, my delegation. Because we want, when you succeed, we all succeed, uh, uh, Ambassador Volkan. I will be quick. Uh, the UN, since it was formed in 1945, a uh, few countries, including Turkey, were the original members, but it has expanded with decolonization to include more and more member states. This has been both an opportunity and a challenge for the UN. Because the UN succeeded in the decolonization uh, field, and, uh, but now this increased the divide between the developed North and the developing South. And uh, my colleagues will tell you how divisive the last two uh, general assembly sessions have been where we have voted on all resolutions that we had were used for consensus. And uh, uh, I would like to pick your ideas on how you intend to navigate this because it can paralyze the work of the general assembly. To me, the division between the North and South is artificial most of the time, but I would want to Pick your brains on how that one will, will work. And uh, I also want to, on the issue that is tied to the expansion of the UN, is the issue of South South cooperation. As the president of the High Level Committee on South South cooperation, uh, which is part of the General Assembly, I would want, as more countries from the South have developed and developed expertise, even with COVID, we have seen experiences from the developed South that have really been innovative but also not only South-South cooperation, but triangular cooperation as well, working with the developed North. And the Turkey has been very active with the technology bank and all that. I would want to see how your agenda on really strengthening what your predecessors have done in this, in this field. And lastly, Mr. Ambassador, uh, is the issue of the Security Council in relationship to the General Assembly. Uh, the Security Council has increasingly been paralyzed. Would you be willing to invoke the Uniting for Peace clause that was has been practiced when there is no consensus in the general in the Security Council, the General Assembly states in on matters of international peace and security. Would you be willing to explore that if the continued paralyzation of the Security Council persists? And again, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, you have our support, uh, Ambassador Orkan. Thank you. Thank you, Uganda, uh, Kenya followed by Bolivia, and finally, Interparliamentary Union. 
Thank you very much, Professor Tijani, our PGA, for the able manner in which you're managing the affairs of the office, even under very extraordinary times caused by the novel coronavirus, and for facilitating this interactive engagement with the incoming PGF. Your Excellency Ambassador Volkan was here. We welcome you and welcome your vision statement. My two questions have been raised by colleagues who spoke before me, but um, let me assure you of Kenya's support and hope that um, you will use your tenure as the next PGA to advance the global understanding and critical role of multilateralism and solidarity in our modern world and in serving the development needs of member states and peoples. It is equally important and indeed a general expectation that efforts should be made for a global solidarity to ensure that challenges or problems caused by COVID-19 should not be exacerbated by barriers and embargoes, especially with regard to access to medicines, vaccines, and other essential supplies at this critical time in the world's history in order to save lives. I will conclude by hoping that you'll continue with the good ongoing efforts to improve the working relations between the GA and the other principal organs of the United Nations. The GA as the only universally representative body will play a, a pivotal role in this regard. I thank you and we wish you well. Thank you, Bolivia. Bolivia, are you with us? Bolivia. Uh, no. If Bolivia is not is not ready, we go to interparliamentary union. Interparliamentary union. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Janimade, and thank you very much also to Volkan Boskir. I feel very happy to have a parliamentarian uh, just about to be elected as president of the General Assembly. So uh, I think that we are going to be able to work together a lot. You have been part of the IPU events. You went to our P20 meeting in Japan. You know how the parliamentarians are building a bridge. I think a very important bridge between the international commitments and the national realities. It is through parliaments where we are ratifying uh, international agreements, then we translate them into, into national law, and of course we allocate the needed budget to make them a reality. I believe that there's a lot to do together. We usually have our annual hearing, just as we did with the President of the General Assembly, uh, and we are looking forward to work together. I would like to propose to have a, a webinar or something uh, with the IPU, the national parliaments, the parliamentarians, in order to interact closer and to start a, a process where we can be, as parliamentarians, more useful for the international commitment. The UN Charter starts saying, with the people. Well, the parliamentarians are representing the people, and we're looking forward to work closer with the United Nations. Now, during this uh, health crisis, Many of you already mentioned that there's an immediate and clear economic crisis. And I'm sure that we're also going to need to fight for democracy and human rights. Fear must not be used as a tool for empowering governments in decrease of uh, liberties and freedoms of the people or against democracy. So I think that this is going to be a very important year, a very important process where we need to strengthen multilateralism and we need to translate that into local solutions for the people that we represent. Uh, congratulations, President of the General Assembly. Congratulations also to, to Volkan, my colleague parliamentarian, for this huge opportunity. I, I really look uh, forward to have a, a closer relationship with the United Nations. We already have one, but it's, it's great to have an MP who is going to be uh, uh, closer to the IPU. Thank you very much. Uh, is Bolivia ready? If Bolivia is not ready, uh, may I, with my permission, request His Excellency in 10 minutes 
to uh, reflect because it's really not answering one by one, that's impossible to reflect on the issues raised very aptly by, by colleagues. I'm sure there'll be other opportunities for uh, engaging uh, on those issues. But for now, 10 minutes reflections from His Excellency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. Uh, 10 minutes, uh, I will try. Uh, first of all, uh, concerning the uh, uh, countries in special situations, uh, LDCs, LLDCs, since I tried to start with them, I think LDCs remain on top of the global development agenda. And uh, uh, LDC 5, uh, the conference to be held in Qatar 2021, will be a critical step, take stock of the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action. And it's important to make sure the, that COVID-related delays of GA uh, work uh, does not affect the ambition and success of the conference. During my tenure, my office will remain ready to contribute to these efforts. Development of LLDCs is an integral part of the 2030 agenda. Implementation of the Vienna Program of Action remains key in diversifying the economies and improving the industrial capacities of the LLDCs. Efforts of the LLDCs uh, to integrate climate resilient infrastructure to their development strategies should be supported. And uh, science and technology and innovation is crucial here. Sharing technology, best practices and know-how with the countries in need are significant for uh, strengthening uh, their resilience. 2030 agenda will be incomplete without the development of SIDS, which remain a special case in the development uh, agenda. So effective and timely implementation of the Samoa pathway is an essential part of the collective efforts. SIDS have uh, no considerable com contribution to global warming. However, they are the most affected countries by climate change. Science, technology and innovation is crucial sharing technology, best practices, and know-how with these countries in need are significant for strengthening the resilience. Of course, uh, ODA and other concessional finance are also important for a number of middle-income countries, taking into account their uh, specific needs. South-South cooperation, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, is another effective tool to improve dialogue among uh, the Global South the bottlenecks uh, that impede sustainable development can be overcome easier through a uh, shared vision and helping one another as a uh, complement to the North-South cooperation. Uh, concerning the questions asked by the stakeholders, uh, SDGs by 2030, the first question was, I think we have 10 years until uh, 2030 and uh, has just started an ambitious decade of action. So it's indeed time for action with necessary mobilization and active cooperation of uh, various stakeholders, including member states, states uh, international organizations, civil society, academia, private sector. There's a great potential in front of us. It all depends uh, on our will. The second question was, how do you see UN in the next 10 years? Hopefully, a uh, more accountable, effective response, uh, responsive to the real problems of real people, closer to the people would be uh, my answer to that question. The third question was uh, concerning uh, trade uh, conflicts. Uh, as, as PGA, I can only take actions uh, with an existing uh, mandate for uh, bilateral trade problems. There are more competent international organizations, such as World Trade Organization, uh, to address uh, this matter. Concerning uh, the uh, question asked by uh, Morocco, the pandemic has already affected our future agenda and many meetings are either cancelled or postponed. Therefore, we may need to review our list of priorities and further streamline the activities for the 75th session. This may necessitate compromises and in some instances, sacrifices. But this is a task 
the first and foremost for the UN members, I would remain ready to contribute to these efforts uh, with my uh, mandate. Uh, there was a question uh, by Algeria concerning people under oppression. Uh, every human being is entitled to certain rights and freedoms, originating from various international instruments. Some people, however, are not able to exercise their rights and freedoms for different reasons. I use this term together with the concept of the most vulnerable in the general context of the UN Sustainable Development Agenda, including paragraph uh, 23. I do not intend to make any reference, implicitly or explicitly, to any issue which is not covered by the UN resolutions or the Charter of the UN. If I may come to the issue of Palestine from this, I think I have already shared my views with regard to this issue, but let me underline uh, that the Palestinian issue uh, is an important issue and will be addressed during my term in line with the UN resolutions and the international law. Uh, concerning uh, multilateralism, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has once again showed the importance of global cooperation. And the pandemic not only constitutes a health, -to -health challenge, uh, but it creates further social and economic difficulties, as well as challenges related uh, with human rights. We have to face this challenge together and make good use of multilateralism in order to reach a better future of sustainable peace uh, and development. Effective multilateralism is also the best guarantor of uh, international security and prosperity. United Nations has played and continues to play a key role in safeguarding peace and security in the world. An international community developed institutions and adopted rules. These institutions and rules help us resolve our conflicts peacefully. They enable us to establish norms and platforms for dealing with global challenges, from climate change to weapons of mass destruction. We should therefore view consensus building and compromise as virtues of strength, not as signs of weakness. Indeed, I'm pleased to see that member states are not completely restricted by the prevailing circumstances. I welcome the initiative by Singapore to organize together with the Forum of Small States, POS, and the Elders, a virtual high-level forum to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations with a focus on uh, multilateralism. Uh, concerning uh, uh, the other question was, uh, let me check. Uh, yeah, sustaining peace and uh, prevention was uh, another question asked. I think building and uh, maintaining peace are among the core purposes of the United Nations. So member states have the primary responsibility to build and maintain peace. So these two concepts are of a cross-cutting nature that concerns both the General Assembly and the Security Council as well as uh, the uh, three pillars of the UN work. So namely, uh, peace and security, sustainable development and human rights. So in recognition of this, the General Assembly and the Security Council concurrently adopted in 2016, the twin resolutions on sustaining peace. And sustaining peace, most of the time, requires addressing the roots of conflicts, which can be traced in exclusion, inequality, discrimination, and violation of human rights. In this regard, I think the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development offers us a global framework where these problems can be, uh, can be addressed and resilient societies are, are built. Uh, sustaining peace does not have a complex formula. Security, development, and access to justice are the main components. There is no peace uh, without uh, development and no development uh, without uh, peace. 
So in efforts for sustainable peace, one critical uh, important concept is prevention. In many conflict cases around the world, sustaining peace actually means prevention of uh, conflict. So I welcome the Secretary General's emphasis on conflict prevention since the beginning of this term. Therefore, uh, I will also underline the significance of building and sustaining peace and prevention when relevant uh, the agenda of the work of the General Assembly. Uh, concerning uh, concerning uh, the question asked by my colleague from Cyprus, uh, I will be sitting in the chair as the President of the United Nations General Assembly. So I will be guided by the decisions, the rules and procedures of the United Nations. In this regard, impartiality will be one of the guiding uh, principles of my work. In return, I ex expect every member state to reciprocate in the same kind. Uh, with this understanding, I will engage constructively with the whole membership, uh, as I have mentioned in my uh, previous comments. Concerning uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, statement by my colleague from uh, Armenia, I think there has been a uh, lack of uh, coordination within the group. I have uh, met with uh, all geographical group uh, representatives, the May, May chairs of the five geographical groups, and the uh, Eastern European group is now chaired by His Excellency Ivan Sivanovich. So we had a wonderful talk as he's, the, uh, he's representing the Eastern European group. And I'm sure uh, he will uh, share our discussion with him, uh, with, with my colleague from Armenia. Uh, not only with the geographical groups, but I also had meetings with the Central Asian group, MICTA, and uh, also uh, the non-aligned movement, uh, G77 and China group, the least developed countries, landlocked uh, developing countries, small island developing countries, the Forum of Small States, and the Economic and Social Council. So I met with 13 groups and uh, altogether uh, 40 permanent representatives before this meeting. And it was very useful, as I have mentioned, to have those uh, uh, consultations. Uh, I think I have answered the questions uh, in the time you have permitted me uh, present. But one thing I want to say, I think this meeting, which, uh, which is now almost uh, three hours and 44 minutes, uh, is uh, clear evidence that there is a need of uh, the General Assembly uh, meeting uh, as soon as possible uh, to, uh, to again uh, present a platform for all the countries uh, to uh, as, as a voice and to come out with the solutions. Uh, and I, I'm really thankful to you uh, personally and as the PGA uh, that you are doing a marvelous job. But I think that this is a critical moment when all the world is uh, having their eyes on the United Nations and the United Nations with all its pillar institutions and I think the General Assembly is, is one of the most important ones, must really uh, uh, react and uh, prove to the world that it is the perhaps sole organization in, in political matters and crisis situations uh, to deliver. Uh, I, I thank you to all my colleagues for their uh, visionary statements, their support, and through their questions, I had a chance to get the pulse of, of the United Nations. I'm looking forward to our next meeting, which I hope will not be virtual, but physical. And I wish you all the best. I wish uh, that you all stay in good health and let us meet each other in good health. Thank you very much, President Banda, and all the colleagues who have participated to this very fruitful and useful meeting. Well, let me, on behalf of the Assembly, thank our friend and the incoming or the candidate for the PGA at, at the 75th session uh, on, on behalf of the Assembly to thank you for uh, really this interactive session uh, which has gone longer than expected but uh, reflective obviously of the keenness 
of the membership to interact with you and to draw you out on your vision uh, because it is also their vision and I, I, I thank you greatly. This has been very, very uh, useful to all of us uh, and uh, going forward I'm sure we'll have other opportunities to engage you. I, I thank you greatly. Uh, my office uh, has worked very closely with the all concerned. The technical people, I should thank them because they extended beyond the normal because we, we had to appeal. Uh, members just wanted to talk and we didn't want to leave any, anyone behind. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Bye-